Chapter 13, 12. Visiting Aunt Vera. After refueling, we went to Aunt Vera. Vera Tennyson, Grandpa Max's sister, but she knows nothing about his stormy youth. Apparently, they are not very close. As we drove, I decided to take some time for Gwen. Of course, I like her, she is smart, beautiful, and interesting. And even I see that she is in love with me, but I still can't take the last step and normally talk to her about our feelings. Deciding to watch a movie with her, I took out my laptop, called her to lie on the bed and lie in an embrace. She only happily agreed to this, grabbed me like a tick. So we spent the rest of the way to the house of Aunt Vera. Underscore. Vera decided to live in a small town in the desert. Even though it was just the beginning of summer, the temperature was already over 30 degrees Celsius. I don't know how these old people can live here. But they shouldn't be cold. Arriving, we were met by Vera Tennyson herself. In general, she is the older sister of her grandfather and his brother Gordon. She was now 64 years old. In fact, she looked good enough for her age. Apparently her love for strange dishes, like her grandfather's, is evident. She had gray hair, was overweight and, in my opinion, was wearing too much pink. As soon as we left the mobile home, a warm and too tight hug was waiting for us. And, of course, Aunt Vera's special ritual when meeting her grandchildren. Namely, she patted our cheeks. It was very unpleasant. Just as we entered her house, the old man, in whom I recognized Marty, looked out from the window of the neighboring house. Gwen and I have seen it before, when we came here last times. He also treated us to sweets. When Marty looked at us he hissed his mouth wide open and cracked his neck unnaturally. Besides me, Gwen saw it too. So after Marty closed the blinds, she quickly asked me with wide eyes. Did you see that? Or it seemed to me? Saw. So, it seems that something is happening in this city. I'll need to figure it out later. Until then, be careful. I whispered in her ear. At my words, Gwen nodded and walked into the house with a brisk pace. After that there was lunch. As I expected, we were fed the next nasty thing. Although this time, it was not all that bad, just jelly with beef and Brussels sprouts, it could be worse. Then I decided to invite Gwen to take a walk around the city. By doing this, shoot several birds with one stone. Spend time with Gwen. Deal with local aliens. And arrange an adventure for Gwen. I'm not worried about her, she can handle it. If that I will help her. But, just in case, I took a water gun that was on the bus from somewhere. Underscore. Gwen POV. After a weirdest lunch, Lex invited me to take a walk around town. Is this a date? Hope this is the case. In any case, we will be able to spend at least a little time alone, we have rarely been able to do this since the beginning of the trip. Now grandfather is always nearby, then Lex is busy with his own business. He does not devote time to me at all, so he also gets stuck in some stories without us. But nothing, since we are alone, I will definitely be able to advance our relationship at least a little. Aunt Vera allowed us to take her golf cart. Therefore, we sat down in this car together and went for a drive. Lex was driving, although I also wanted to drive, but it seemed more romantic, so I didn't mind. While we were driving on cart, there were a lot of old people around and they looked at us in a strange way. So I decided to talk to Lex about it. Do you see those strange looks too? Yes, after all, something is wrong in this city. Lex said seriously. With this I completely agreed, these strange looks, plus there was also that old man whom we saw at the entrance to the city. He did a back somersault from the roof of the second floor and landed quite normally. Continuing on our way, in one of the windows we saw how a certain old woman, chasing a fly, jumped to the ceiling, caught hold of it like a spider and simply devoured this very fly. What an abomination. I said with disgust. That's for sure. Lex said casually. After that, we no longer thought that something would surprise us, but no surprise. We saw Marty, Aunt Vera's neighbor, driving his golf cart, 
with a folded carpet on the next seat. Just then, a water sprinkler turned on on the lawn. Marty saw the water and drove around the spray in a wide arc, as if it were sulfuric acid. Shall we follow? I suggested. Yes. Lex replied. And we went for Marty. After five minutes of surveillance, Marty stopped at the dumpsters. Taking the carpet, he stretched his legs three meters and simply stepped over the fence. And he went on as if nothing had happened. Stunned by what I saw, I looked at Lex and saw that he, keeping a calm face, began to chase Marty. Without thinking anymore, I followed him. Hiding by the fence, we watched as Marty, or whoever it was, pushed a heavy trash can with one hand. There was a secret entrance under the tank. Marty opened the entrance and took the carpet and went inside. What do we do? I asked nervously. Let's wait a minute and follow. This is definitely not Marty and not a man, and somehow he behaves suspiciously. There is also this carpet, it feels like there is definitely a body hidden there. Lex said thoughtfully as he touched the selection. We nodded at his words and waited. A minute later, we climbed over the fence and slowly walked to the secret hatch. Opening the hatch that Marty closed, we looked down and saw a tunnel there. Be as quiet as possible. Lex warned me and helped me down. He himself followed, not forgetting to quietly close the hatch. It was dark in the tunnel itself, but Lex turned on the flashlight on his phone and illuminated everything. By this time, Marty was not seen, but his tracks were visible. We followed them. After 10 minutes of wandering through this tunnel, we finally found something interesting. We saw a spaceship, and outside there were some kind of egg-shaped cocoons. Coming closer and looking inside the cocoons, we saw pensioners. Really, all these old people were kidnapped and put in these cocoons? I asked in shock. Most likely, they were not only kidnapped, but also replaced. Look, this is a granny with a fly. Lex said and pointed to one of the cocoons. But how did they do it? And why would they? I asked. These aliens are apparently some kind of shapeshifters. Remember how the pseudo-Marty lengthened his legs? And about why, I don't know. Maybe old people for them, something like a snack. Lex said with a shrug. Do not joke so. I hissed. I'm not kidding, you never know what happens. Then a hole appeared on the ship from which Marty came out. Seeing us, he hissed and lunged at me. Frightened, I didn't have time to do anything, but Lex did. Seeing Marty, he pulled out a water gun from his bosom and fired at the alien. When a stream of water hit him, he screamed, and screaming in agony dissolved into a puddle. What was it? Trying to understand what is happening, I asked. Just water. Do you remember how pseudo-Marty dodged the water, so I thought it was their weakness? Not surprisingly, they settled here with such and such heat. And I took the gun myself to play a trick on you, who would have thought that it would be so useful. Lex said, twirling the toy. Ignoring the part where he wanted to play a trick on me, we went to the entrance to the ship. Just as we entered it, the alarm sounded. And inside we saw another three dozen cocoons. Apparently I was right, they want to take the old people and fly away. And now, on alarm, all these creatures will return here. But this is even good, you will not need to look for them. Take the gun for now and shoot them when they appear, and I'll take all the cocoons out of the ship. And then I will destroy it. Handing me the water gun, Lex said. Just at that moment, shouts were heard from the entrance to the cave. Turning to the sound, I saw several old men who were running at an unnatural speed and on the way lost their false appearance. They really looked like a humanoid green jelly, with arms and legs, and inside them you could see the internal organs. Stop them! Said Lex, and he turned into his blue runner, and began to take out the cocoons one by one. While he was doing this, I fired back. Despite the fact that I have already killed ten, their number did not diminish. When I ran out of water, there were still about a hundred of them, and maybe more. 
At that moment, they were already almost beside me, but thank God that Lex had just finished and stood in front of me. After a yellow flash, and then a blue one, a robotic alien stood in the place of the runner. So this is what he is, Overflow. Becoming Overflow, he put his arms forward and shot the aliens with torrents of water. In one attack, he destroyed more than half of these slugs, but still there are a lot of them. After another flash, he already became a fire guy and sent a fireball upward. Not understanding why he did it, I looked up and saw a pipe running under the ceiling, from which water was dripping. After hitting the ball, the pipe burst and water poured from there. This rain destroyed all the other slugs. When there were no enemy aliens left, Lex came up to me and took me in his arms like a princess, after which he turned into a runner and instantly carried me to the cave entrance. After putting me on the ground, Lex, after another flash of light, became an upgrade, which immediately turned into a robot and, putting out a bunch of guns, destroyed the slug ship. After that, we had to deliver all these cocoons to the central square, from where I helped the old people get out, while Lex delivered the rest of the eggs. Then the pensioners did it themselves. In half an hour we finished everything and took our golf cart and went home to Aunt Vera. Well, how do you like it? Did you like our little date? Lex asked with a teasing smile. Very. So this was a date? I asked nervously. If you so want, then so be it. Lex said. At that moment, I decided to do something incredibly daring. I kissed him. At first he was surprised, but later he began to return my kiss. We kissed for almost a minute, we would love to continue, but due to the fact that Lex was driving, we could not continue for a long time, he almost knocked over trash cans. After that, we, with red faces, drove on in silence. Nobody said anything. Arriving a couple of minutes later, we entered the house. Their grandfather and aunt played chess. Saying that I was very tired, I refused dinner and went to bed with a stupid smile on my face. Before leaving, I saw the same smile on Lex's face. Chapter 14, 13. Analyzes. June 7, 2010. The next morning, after breakfast, at which Gwen looked at me all the time and blushed terribly, apparently remembering our yesterday's kiss, Gwen ran off to explore the city. To be honest, I did not expect such a bold act from her, but not that I was against it. We need to give her time to cool down, at least until the evening, so that she can at least look at me and not blush. And then you can talk and, if you're lucky, repeat the kiss. I liked yesterday. And I decided to devote at least a little time to Aunt Vera so that she would not be offended. After all, we came to visit her, it is imperative to be with her, she is probably lonely in this city. Therefore, until lunchtime, I spent time with Vera and Max. We played a little chess and backgammon. Then we drank tea while Aunt Vera talked about her collection of stuffed birds and ships in bottles. In fact, quite a large and cool collection, impressive in scope. When lunch came, Gwen returned. By this time, she no longer blushed at the sight of me, but still could not look me in the eyes. Nothing, everything will be fine by evening. Having dined on another strange jelly with an incomprehensible content, Gwen was about to run away again, but I caught her at the entrance. Taking her by the elbow at the door and pulling her towards me, I whispered in her ear. Stay and spend at least a little time with Aunt Vera. She may be offended that you run away all the time. If you don't want to be alone with me, I'll leave and take a walk before dinner. I just have things to do. Blushing at our closeness, she thought a little and said. It's not that I don't want to be alone with you, I'm just very embarrassed after yesterday. I understand and do not blame you for anything. I really liked it and I want more. But we'll talk about that later. Come to my room when everyone is asleep and we'll talk about everything. In the meantime, go and take some time to your aunt and grandfather. I'll be back for dinner. Did you really like it? Gwen blushed even more and timidly asked. Yes. Very. Now come back. I said with a smile and kissed her temple. 
Smiling at me, Gwen walked back into the living room. She also wagged her ass. The devil. Underscore. In the meantime, I went outside, went into the RV and took DNA samples of my heroes, and then turned into XLR8 and went to the plumber's base in Bellwood. There I had a laboratory set up, which I used to create Morgana and my other gadgets. This laboratory has all the equipment I need to analyze alien DNA. A minute later I was at the secret entrance to the base. I had to turn back in order to go inside, since the entrance was based on biometrics, which cannot be removed while I am an alien. This base, in fact, no longer belongs to the plumbers. After my grandfather brought me here, I spent a lot of time here, so I made a lot of adjustments for convenience. After the creation of Morgana, I used her to update the base's defenses. Now my dear artificial intelligence has access to everything at the base and is responsible for its safety. I also refurbished the old laboratory using the best alien technology available to me. Plus, there is the most powerful computer on Earth, which I also created and is controlled by Morgana. Of course, there is also a place to live here. This is essentially my own bat cave. And only my grandfather and I have access to it. Just in case, I deleted all information from the orderly's databases about this place so that only her former operatives would know about its existence. That is, mostly old friends of my grandfather, so there shouldn't be any problems. By the way, I hid the hands of Armageddon in the basement. Their time has not come yet. Going inside, I immediately went to the laboratory, where I turned on the computer. After taking all the blood and other materials of the aliens from the container, I put them on a special analyzer. Morgana, please do a full check of all samples. I ordered. Of course, darling. Morgana babbled sweetly, then set to work. After 15 minutes, the results were ready. Judging by them, all the aliens I turn into are completely healthy and have no flaws. This is good. But what's bad is that all aliens have a completely average result. That is, every alien is a confident average person. And yes, they are all teenagers. It seems that only from the moment I receive the Omnitrix, development begins, and I will be able to increase the power of my aliens through training and other means. Seems like this is why Ben wasn't 10 years old as aliens. This is kind of a starting point. And by the way, that's why Ben's 10 aliens were adults. This will need to be corrected somehow. After all, despite all my training for 10 years, when I turn into heroes, I have the same strength as the original Ben. I just use them better. It's a shame. But nothing, I have an idea how to fix it. After reviewing all the analyzes, I went to the training ground that I created specifically for this moment. I want to personally test the power of the aliens and to make a comparison of real results, my knowledge from the canon and data from the database of plumbers. After two hours of constant transformations and studying my aliens, I was really convinced of the veracity of the test results. And that makes me really shitty. For example, my heat blast, despite the fact that the flame is white, is not fucking hot as I thought. Exactly the average result of pyronite. Even the power is also average. But while checking my strength I learned to fly. It wasn't that hard. Plus, I learned a little about how to manage lava and earth. It is quite difficult, but you can learn, you just need time. The power of the 4 and punch is also average, as is the speed of the XLR8. And the speed of the rip jaws in the water too, I tested this in the pool, which is also here. The jaws of the rip jaws are also of average bite force, as well as the duration of habitation on land, exactly 3 minutes. The durability of the diamond head and the speed of creating weapons, the scent and strength of the wild mutt, the flight speed of the stink fly and the jet ray too. Ditto is also normal, as is feedback. But the intelligence of the gray matter is beyond praise. Judging by a special IQ test that was created on Galvin Prime, in the form of a gray matter, I have exactly 1000 IQ points. Although I call it an IQ test, it's not at all true. There is an incredibly accurate and complex questionnaire, 
which, with an accuracy of 99.5%, determines the intelligence of a person. This test has nothing to do with a human, but it is more convenient for me to call it IQ. So, in the form of a gray matter, my telekinesis and telepathy have a large increase in power, almost four times stronger. But there are no other psychic abilities. Apparently, for me they open only in human form. I didn't find any information about the upgrade and the ghost freak in the database. But I can say with confidence that they are also ordinary. The wrath is also average, but I found out that he has huge regeneration and the claws on his hands can extend even more than they are. Straight some kind of wolverine. About the slug, whom I got from scanning the aliens that Gwen and I fought, I'm not sure. Because there is nothing about him in the database either. The only thing I can say is that my slug seems to be stronger than the ones Gwen and I destroyed. Unclear. In fact, these results upset me a lot, because apart from my fighting skills, psi abilities and brains, I am no different from the original Ben. But still, I will fix it, I will need to make sure of something and I will change everything. Since my mood has irrevocably soured, I decided to finish with all the tests and go to my family. Turning off the computer, putting all the remaining tests in a special refrigerator, I turned into an XLR8 and left the base. Within a couple of minutes I entered Vera's house. In just half an hour there will be dinner, maybe the mood will improve. Chapter 15, 14. Love. After dinner, Aunt Vera and Grandpa Max went to bed, although it was only half past seven in the evening. Certainly old age is not a joy. Gwen, immediately after them, went to her room. Apparently she wants time to pass quickly and we could meet. I decided, while there is time, to check the Omnitrix. And then I have a feeling that I have forgotten something. As it turned out, I was right. Even though I turned on cloak for the clock, it doesn't seem to help me much. I did that scheme again with ditto and upgrade, but without the gray matter. This time, my clone, in the form of an upgrade, is a little deeper inside. And, unfortunately, he found something unpleasant. In one of the parts of the device, he found a loophole for the energy that left its mark. This leak appeared due to the connection of a special tracking device and was left on purpose. Apparently, the creator did it to find the Omnitrix when he needed it. Thinking what to do about it, I remembered one upcoming event. In a couple of days, if not tomorrow, three bounty hunters are due to arrive and Vilgax will send them. One of these hunters had a tracking device that tracked Ben's transformations through the green light that Ben emitted when transforming. In my case, it is blue light. Apparently they either found or created the same thing as Azmuth. In fact, I thought I wouldn't even meet these types, but in an amicable way I need to meet them. More precisely, with one of them. Tetrax. Getting to know him will come in handy. But everything turned out very well. I will kill two birds with one stone. First, I'll pick up the tracking device, and second, I'll get to know the Tetrax. And I definitely need the device. To close the leak in the watch and destroy the trail, I need to figure out how it works, this is the device itself. After all, if I do something wrong, it will only get worse. And the loophole must be closed so that new guests do not come to me. And about Azmuth, let him suffer, it will be useful for him. Deciding to leave it as it is for now, I summoned the clone back and dispelled it. After which I went to my room, immediately lay down on the bed and, not noticing how, fell asleep. Underscore. Half an hour later I was awakened by Gwen, who came to my room. She crumpled very nicely and blushed as I looked at her. But there was where to look. Her figurine is excellent. For some reason, she was now wearing my t-shirt and little shorts. She looked very seductive now. Sorry to wake you up, but you said to come in when everyone is asleep. Gwen said quietly. Nothing, I was expecting you. I just fell asleep by accident. By the way, is this my t-shirt? I asked. Yes. She said even more quietly, avoiding my gaze. And where did you get it? 
I asked. Well, the last time you slept with us, you forgot her in the guest room. So I took her. Gwen mumbled, blushing. It's clear. And why did you take her? To be used as pajamas. Gwen blushed even more. Pervert. I typed. What? No, it's not, I just really love your smell, even more driving herself into the coffin, said Gwen. And why do you love my smell? I asked with a smile. Because, I love you. Apparently from embarrassment, Gwen could not resist and shouted. Let's be quiet, or you'll wake up the whole street. And I love you too. I said casually, although behind the calm facade, I was also very worried. What? It looks like I broke her, she's going to faint now, out of my head the steam is flooded. Truth? Recovering, Gwen asked me hopefully. Yes. I said frankly. With a squeak of happiness, Gwen flew into my arms with superhuman speed. Cuddling up to me with all her might, she buried herself in my chest and purred like a contented cat. Why did you never say? He didn't even give any hints. Gwen asked. Why did you never say? I asked without answering the question. I was shying. But I still sent you hints all the time. You didn't understand anything. Gwen said resentfully. I understand everything. Exhaling, I admitted. What? But why did you say anything? Gwen asked accusingly, making a disgruntled pug. We're cousins after all, I was worried about what your parents and grandfather would think. I honestly said. On this score, you cannot worry. My mom has known for a long time that I love you. And she said that if we have true love, they will bless us. Gwen said with a confident smile. Yes? I did not know that. I said with shock. But I really didn't even know about it. Yes. But I still worry about children. Gwen said anxiously. But about this, you cannot worry. Since we are partly aliens and anodites as well, we shouldn't have a problem with that. Magic will fix everything. Plus, all these transformations with the Omnitrix do not go without consequences. I said, patting her back soothingly. Something serious? Gwen asked anxiously. There is nothing wrong. It's just that my genes adapt to transformations and change a little so that there are no consequences. Because of what they become more flexible and strong, so to speak. But the more I turn into aliens, the more my genes change. In 10 to 20 years, I will no longer be quite human, but this is actually even good. I will be stronger, healthier, and more durable. Some pluses. I said. By the way, however, I managed to check it. Of course, the transformation of genes does not pass without consequences, but due to my special physique, all the imperfections are cleared from my body and I will never have problems. But maybe Ben will, I don't know for sure. Then it's very good. But I don't understand something. If you found out that there will definitely not be incest, why did you not confess to me, especially since you knew that I love you too? Gwen asked me seriously, noticing the inconsistency in my words. Oops. I seem to have been caught. Well, you know, I really didn't want to start building a serious relationship so early, I began, but Gwen was interrupted. I understood everything. You just want to make yourself a harem. Gwen said mercilessly. How do you know? I asked in shock. Do you think I don't know you at all? Or do you think I haven't seen your magazines or search history? Or your views on girls? I always knew that you are still a perverted person and you definitely will not be limited to one girl. Gwen said, pointing her finger in my chest. Yeah, I didn't expect to be discovered. I said wearily. But I really didn't know, I thought I was encrypted well. In my opinion, even my parents, with my grandfather, know about this. Seriously? The devil is ashamed of how. So what was your plan? Did you want to slowly inspire me with the idea of a harem while traveling? 
Gwen asked with a mischievous smile. Looks like I was completely disclosed. I said absolutely doomed. Certainly. I know you better than anyone. But I really don't mind. Said unexpected words, Gwen. What? Seriously? I asked incredulously. I just love you too much. And I cannot refuse you. But under several conditions. Gwen said with a very eerie smile. I'm listening. I answered immediately. Still, at that moment she was really scary. Firstly, I will be the main wife. Secondly, you take girls into your harem, only with my permission. That's all for now, I'll think of something else later. Gwen said with the brightest smile in the world. But I felt that if I didn't agree now, I was finished. I have no choice? I asked, knowing the answer perfectly well. Not. Was an immediate response. Okay, I agree. But, at that moment the atmosphere became serious. Still, remember that I'm your boyfriend now. I'm not some kind of heel to be pushed around. Don't cross the line in your control. I said absolutely seriously. Good. Gwen said a little nervously and pressed closer to me. That's good. Now come here. I'll kiss you. I said to Gwen, then pulled her closer and kissed her. To this, Gwen just melted in my arms and began to kiss me back. So we continued kissing until late at night, after which we fell asleep together in my bed. Chapter 16, 15 Bounty Hunters and Magic June 8, 2010 The next morning, I woke up at dawn, still hugging Gwen, who was lying on top of me. Since the old men were about to wake up, I decided to take Gwen to her room. Putting Gwen on her bed and covering it with a blanket, I returned to my room and fell asleep again. Two hours later my grandfather woke me up. During breakfast, Gwen glowed with happiness, which Max no doubt noticed, but ignored. After breakfast, we said goodbye to Aunt Vera and set off to continue our journey. Underscore. Third POV. In space near the Earth, there was a spaceship. This ship belonged to Vilgax. Inside the spacecraft, on the training ground, three silhouettes stood in the shadows. After turning on the searchlight, in these silhouettes one could recognize three well-known in the underworld of the galaxy, bounty hunters. They were Six Six, Krob, and Tetrax. Vilgax's voice came from the intercom and he ordered the hunters to start the competition. Six Six decided to show itself first. Coming down from the platform they were all standing on, using his jetpack, he began destroying the Vilgax drones with his weapons hidden throughout his suit. After Six Six destroyed a dozen robots, Krob decided to go down as well. After landing, with his large pincer and sword, Krob destroyed several more drones. Until the ceiling opened and a large robot jumped out. When the robot appeared, Tetrax, who had still not moved before, took out his flying board and flew towards the robot. The robot, on the other hand, fired its laser at the approaching Tetrax, but he calmly took the shot on himself without receiving any damage. Having flown close enough, he jumped and punched right through with his robot carcass, thereby destroying it, and calmly landed on his feet, making a superhero landing at the same time. After completing the test, Vilgax, still unrecovered, appeared on the holographic screen, saying. Well, great. You suit me. Your task is to bring the Omnitrix back here. Those who succeed will receive a reward. Do this so that it doesn't become. Following Vilgax's words, one of his soldiers brought three tracking devices that tracked the Omnitrix by its glow as it transformed its user. Having received the devices, all three hunters went to the escape pods and they were sent to Earth. Underscore. Lex POV. Five hours after our departure from Aunt Vera, we stopped near an abandoned mining town, Slaterville. I asked my grandfather about this, because it was time to start teaching Gwen in magic. First, we all had lunch, after which Gwen and I walked away from the bus and, having laid a blanket, right on the ground, sat on it. 
and the grandfather himself began to delve into the engine, something happened to him there. Now, Gwen, sit in the lotus position and breathe evenly. I began. Sitting down, as I said, Gwen asked curiously. What will you teach me? First, you will need to feel the magic within you. Then you will need to take control of it and learn how to manage it. Since you are partly anodite, like me, this will not be difficult. I said in a lecturer tone. Why? Gwen asked, bowing her head sweetly. You see, Gwen, the anodites are a completely energetic race. They are made up of mana. Therefore, controlling mana is as natural for them as breathing for us. Although you're only one quarter anodite, you still have the gift of heaven. This means that with training you can become a full-fledged anodite. But right now, you should naturally have excellent control and some instinctive understanding of magic. I enlightened my cousin. After my words, Gwen's eyes shone directly, but taking control of herself, she asked. What can you do now, with magic? At the moment, I can, by accelerating the current of mana in my body, increase my physical characteristics by about 20%. I can also do this. After my words, I raised my left hand and a dark blue haze came out of it, which after a few seconds took the form of an unstable transparent disc. When the disc was more or less able to stabilize, I threw it at the nearest stone. On impact, the disc exploded and slightly spoiled the stone. Gwen looked at this with wide eyes, after which she said only. Cool. This is a magical construction. The anodites use them as their main weapon in battle. This is very natural and simple for them. For ordinary magicians, magic is much more difficult. At the very least, you need to use spells, and more complex magic requires rituals. As you noticed, I did not use any spells, but only for constructions. For you and me, even to create a fireball, you need a spell. But I don't know any spells. Then you will need to find them and learn. But in the future, the more we learn and the stronger we become, the easier it will be. Moreover, as the descendants of the Anodites, we have an exceptional talent for magic. Magic itself loves us. I finished my monologue. Why was your disc so unstable? Having digested the new information, asked Gwen. Well done, that noticed. Since I did not devote any time to magic, just a little more than a week, the creation of this disc is the only thing I have learned, besides the control of mana inside the body. I still have to work and work to make it completely stable. Later, after a couple of years, maybe less, it will be quite easy for me to create structures, but this requires training. Now let's start your training. I said. At my words, Gwen just nodded and began to follow my instructions. We finished in two hours. Gwen is really much more talented than me in magic. During this time, she easily learned to feel mana. I was able to do this in only four hours, and this is at my 40 times the learning rate. Just when we returned to grandfather, the clock beep, which means that a tracking device has arrived in the planet's atmosphere. Yes, I installed backtracking. When the tracking device is on my planet, the watch sends me a signal. This means that guests will be arriving soon. What's happened? Noticing the signal, asked the grandfather. Guests are coming to us. In terms of? Asked, who joined our conversation, Gwen. Yesterday I noticed in the watch the ability to track them through a special device. I could not remove this feature without the device itself. Therefore, I decided not to touch anything, but set a signal when such a device arrives on Earth. I said. So, then someone came to Earth in search of the Omnitrix? Asked the grandfather. Yes. I replied calmly. And what should we do? How soon will they find us? Gwen asked. They won't find us until I turn into an alien. The last time I did this was last night, so the trail is gone. But you have to do something about it, you can't just hide. And I have a plan. Putting my hand on my chin, I said. 
You want to lure them, prepare the battlefield, defeat them and pick up the device to remove the possibility of surveillance. Said the grandfather quickly. As expected of him. Immediately understood everything. Yes everything is correct. This is my plan. Now I'm turning into an alien so that they can catch the signal and go in our direction. Then I will go to the nearest abandoned mine and wait for them there. You and Gwen will cover me and help, if anything. I said. Good plan. I just have the right weapon for this. I just need to put the bus closer to the mine so that I can shoot from it. Max said after a little thought. What should I do? Gwen asked. I'll give you a weapon too, for self-defense, or you'll cover me. Just be careful, please. Grandpa said seriously. In fact, it was a huge sign of trust from Grandpa. Certainly. Gwen said with a smile. Apparently happy from the opportunity to help. All right, everything is decided. You go to the mine now and get ready. Then call me when everything is ready and I will come running. Then we will wait for the guests. I said. Nodding at my words, Gwen and Max got on the bus and drove to the mine. I began to wait. Chapter 17, 16. Battle and Tetrax. An hour later, Gwen called me and said they were ready. Putting the phone in my pocket, I turned into Diamond Head with a mental command. I decided to leave a trail first so that the hunters would be sure of the presence of the Omnitrix. Plus, Tetrax will see that Petra Sapien is available to me, as it was in the original, it won't hurt. After destroying a couple of cacti and stones, I turned into XLR8 and rushed to the mine. Underscore. Third POV. Ten minutes after the departure of our main character, three aliens arrived at the place where Lex and Gwen were training in magic. One of them looked like a golden brown robotic crab. Its most distinctive feature was one large claw. It was a space bounty hunter named Krob. The second was wearing a fully enclosed dark green spacesuit. It was Tetrax Shard. The last was 6'6", wearing the purple full-body suit common to his race. They all came here in search of the Omnitrix, on the orders of Vilgax. Tetrax looked at the alien compass-like device in his left hand and said. The Omnitrix was last activated here. He then walked to the spot where Lex had left footprints in the form of Tadenite crystals. When Tetrax tried to pull the crystal out of the stone, 66 managed to intercept it. To this, Tetrax grabbed the mechanical tentacle that held the crystal and tore it off along with it. There was a conflict that was already beginning, Krob stopped. After that 66 threw a few alien, clearly uncensored, words and flew away towards the mine. Krob went to the mine underground, and Tetrax flew on his board. Underscore. Lex POV. When I arrived at the mine, I saw that Max's RV was standing behind one of the rocks. It was difficult to notice when viewed from where I arrived. Very good disguise. Approaching the bus, I saw my grandfather holding a huge cannon and Gwen with a laser pistol. Becoming myself, I praised my grandfather's choice. Not a bad gun. Yes. One of my favorites said grandfather with a smile, stroking the weapon with tenderness. Okay, get on the roof and get ready. And I will go downstairs and wait for the guests. I said, and turning into Jet Ray, I dived into the open space in front of the mine entrance. Near the mine, I became human again and looked towards the bus. Indeed, because of the rock, it is practically invisible. A few seconds later, I saw Grandpa and Gwen go up to the roof after which grandfather put down the gun and lay down himself. Gwen lay down beside him. They were not visible. Only a little could see the muzzle of the cannon, but if you didn't know that they were there, you might not notice. In order not to arouse suspicion, I began to walk along the bottom of the ravine and wait for guests. After 15 minutes, something he was long, I felt a vibration under my feet. Knowing what awaits me, jumping to the side, I dodged the claw that was trying to grab my leg. After the claw, 
Krob himself came out of the ground. He was babbling something about giving the watch and so on, but I didn't even listen. After a flash of blue light, I turned into an upgrade and jumped on Krob. He fired a laser from his pincer, but I didn't care where I created a hole in the stomach, through which I passed the laser shot. Clinging to the Krob, I began to consume him. Of course he tried to resist, but everything happened so quickly that he did not notice how I completely covered him. Taking control of him, I just turned off all his equipment and shut him down for the next two days. Having peeled off the crop, I became forearms and took him with both hands into the mine to hide him there until the 6-6 arrived. Putting it deeper inside, I became myself and scanned Krob. At first I thought that nothing would work, because he is a robot, but no, it turned out that he is a cyborg. Apparently, this is a race. Now I have access to the crop form, which is good. Coming out of the mine into the open space, I noticed Tetrax at the top, but pretended not to see it. Three minutes later, 6-6 flew in from the sky. Seeing me, he started firing gun. Dodging several shots, I already wanted to turn into Jet Ray, but my grandfather beat me to it. He shot the hunter in the back. The attack sent 6-6 into the ground. When the hunter was about to get up, I went up to him in the guise of the forearms and with all my foolishness hit him in the head. This hit him even more into the ground. While 6-6 was trying to recover, I turned again. This time I became a gray matter. Going to his head, I climbed into his wiring and unplugged his suit. This also gave him an electric shock, so that in the near future he is not a fighter. Having finished with 6-6, I became myself and looked towards Tetrax. Seeing me looking at him, Tetrax took out his board and flew towards me. Stopping 10 meters from me, he opened his face and looked at me. So are you with them? I asked a question to which I already knew the answer. Not really. I came here with them, but my goal is different. I wanted to take the Omnitrix to protect him and get him to safety. My name is Tetrax Shard. Said Tetrax. Hearing his words, I signaled to my grandfather not to shoot and continued the conversation. My name is Alexander Benjamin Tennyson. And I am the current owner of the Omnitrix. So are you going to pick up the watch? Because I won't let you. I said seriously. No, I'm not going to take them. I saw you fight. You use aliens wisely and you know their advantages, you have excellent fighting instinct and you quickly realized the weaknesses of your enemies. That was awesome. Besides, you knew about our arrival and managed to prepare the battlefield. Tetrax praised me. Wait, you said Tennyson? Are you related to Max Tennyson? Tetrax asked in shock when realized what I said. Yes, he is my grandfather. Turn around, by the way. I said and pointed behind Petra Sapien. At my words, Tetrax turned and saw Grandfather walking towards us, with a cannon at the ready, and still ready to attack. Calm down, Grandfather, he is not our enemy. You can let go of the weapon. I said. Grandpa listened to me, but was still wary. My name is Tetrax. Nice to meet such a great man as you are Max Tennyson. Said Tetrax respectfully. Just at that moment, Gwen approached. Let's connect the hunters for now and talk calmly. I said and went after Krob. Approaching Krob, I searched him and found a search device, which I put in my pocket, I will deal with it later. Having become four arms, I carried him to 6-6. By placing Krob beside 6-6, I became myself. Tetrax took a small cube from his pocket. Before he dumped it, I had time to scan the 6-6. Excellent new available aliens. When the cube was near the hunters, it expanded and absorbed them. Then he became small again and Tetrax took him. Nice portable prison. Then we went to the bus. Sitting beside him, I began a conversation. So you are Petra Sapien? Last? You know? Where? Tetrax asked with shock, clearly not expecting that on Earth they knew the fate of his race. 
Yes, I read about it in the database of the orderlies of the cosmos. I said. Clear. In fact, I was looking for the Omnitrix, not only to protect him. I have heard that this watch contains the DNA of every race that has ever lived in the galaxy. Another race once lived on Petropia, my planet. They were called the Crystallosipians, but they died out long before I was born. I have found one way that I can restore my planet with the help of Crystallosapien. Said Tetrax seriously. And you ask me for help? I asked. Yes. Said Tetrax and looked at me hopefully, bowing his head. Okay, I'll help you when I can access this alien. But I have a request. I said, knowing that I will not have to do anything difficult and it will not cost me anything. Which? Tetrax asked, although he will clearly do whatever I ask, it is so important for him to get his planet and race back. Can you teach me the classic Petrosapiens fighting skills, at least the basics? Who else but you to ask about it? I asked. It's actually not difficult, because thanks to the Omnitrix you get the genetic memory of the aliens. I just need to teach you some tricks and secrets. But I cannot stay too long, I have important things to do. Said Tetrax. I don't need it for a long time, one day is enough with my head. By the way, I forgot to ask who sent the hunters? I asked, remembering that it was time to reveal the main villain. His name is Vilgax. He is a galactic dictator. Said Tetrax, which shocked Max a lot. Vilgax? I myself saw how he died. Said Grandpa Max incredulously, who had previously listened to our conversation. No, that time he survived and began to build up his strength. Then he began to hunt for the Omnitrix. He is currently injured, but will soon recover. Said Tetrax seriously. Who is Vilgax? Asked, before that was silent, Gwen. This is a serious problem, Gwen. But we'll figure it out later. Tetrax, let's go train while we have time. I said and turned into Diamond Head. Tetrax nodded at this and we went to the free space. Chapter 18, 17 Special Training and Crash June 9, 2010 We trained with Tetrax right up to 4 in the morning. During this time, he taught me several techniques and secrets of the Petrosapiens. For example, he taught me how to manage those crystals that I have already used if they are still intact. Very handy for a surprise attack. Also taught to use the spikes on the back as a weapon. Create swords and boomerangs out of them, which you then control. Tetrax also suggested creating shields from crystal for protection. A very versatile shield, since the only thing that destroys it is sound waves of a special frequency. But this is generally the general weakness of the Petrosapiens. By the way, I came up with a trick with the shield. Although recreated rather. I act like Captain America, no one expects this for sure. Plus, he helped me increase my Tatanite crafting speed and helped me tailor some of my fighting skills to Diamond Head's body. With this, I just needed help most of all. Well, everything necessary and basic, I taught you. Now you only need combat experience. Therefore, now we will be sparring. It will also help you understand how best to use your skills with the abilities of my race. By midnight, said Tetrax. Then sparring started. Thanks to them, I was able to slightly adapt the techniques I received today. When we finished sparring, the four of us returned to the bus. Yes, Gwen and Grandpa watched our training all this time, they even missed dinner. We just ate some snacks. Nice to meet you all. I'm glad the Omnitrix is in good hands. If you need help, here's my intercom number, call. Giving his number, said Tetrax. Thanks for training, Tetrax. I was glad to meet you too. You, too, call if something happens. When I can get access to Crystallosapien, I will definitely inform you, I said with a smile and shook hands with Tetrax. He's a good guy after all. Thank you, this is important to me. Take this, this is my gift to you. 
Tetrax said with a smile and handed me his flying board. But don't you need a board to come back? Gwen asked dubiously as she watched me take the board. Instead of answering, Tetrax pressed a button on his sleeve and we saw a large spaceship descend from the sky. Gorgeous ship. I said sincerely. The ship was really cool. Although he had a rather strange shape. But I read that this model is one of the best in the galaxy. They have good speed, and most importantly, very strong defense. Thank you. Well, see you in the future. Said Tetrax, shook hands with Grandfather and Gwen, after which he entered the ship, which soon took off. Good guy. Grandpa said as he watched Tetrax's ship disappear from sight. Yes, cool. Said Gwen, although she practically did not speak to him. I agree. Now let's go to bed, I'm very tired. I said and went to the bus. Nodding at my words, Grandpa and Gwen followed me. But at the entrance, I stopped, turned to Gwen and said. Oh yes, Gwen, here you go. You will need this board more than me. I gave the Tetrax board to Gwen. You're sure? Tetrax gave it to you. Taking the board, Gwen asked doubtfully. Yes, I already have a cool space clock. Have a cool flying board. Besides, I can fly anyway if I become an alien. With a smile, I said. In fact, I can easily create the same, or even better, board myself. This is not difficult. Hearing my words, Gwen smiled happily and kissed my cheek. Thank you. Said Gwen and went to her bed. Grandpa saw all this, gave me a toothy smile and showed his thumb up. I just dismissed his actions and went to bed. Underscore. Third POV. In space, Vilgax, in a healing capsule, watched as Tetrax's ship left Earth and went into hyperspace. I was betrayed. And Vilgax said angrily. Tracking device indicates that they were unable to obtain the Omnitrix. One of his soldiers reported to Vilgax. It looks like a creature in the hands of which the Omnitrix is not only fierce, but also intelligent. But I must be reckoned with. Vilgax said fiercely and continued to swim in his capsule, continuing to heal. Underscore. Lex POV. The next day we woke up only for lunch. Therefore, after eating another masterpiece of my grandfather, we immediately hit the road. While there was time, I decided to finally deal with the tracking device and remove the loophole in the watch. If someone wants to find a watch, he will have to try very hard. While I was taking apart the device, Gwen sat down opposite me and spoke. So who is Vilgax? Gwen argued. You'd better ask your grandfather about it, he knows better. I said, continuing to poke around in the compass. Grandfather? Gwen asked and looked at Max with curiosity. Max listened to our conversation and therefore knew what it was about, so he immediately began to tell everything. You see, Gwen, during my work as a plumber, I ran into Vilgax more than once. He is a tyrant, invader, and ruler of ten worlds. Vilgax is an incredibly cruel, cunning, and powerful alien. Several times he tried to attack the Earth, but we always stopped him. In fact, Vilgax can be called the main villain of the galaxy. And what did you say about the fact that you saw how he died? Impressed by Max's story, Gwen asked quietly. The last time I saw Vilgax, his ship exploded. I thought he was dead, but according to Tetrax he is not. With a grim face, Max said, clearly unhappy that he had not finished off this squid. Also, according to Tetrax, Vilgax is looking for the Omnitrix, which means that he will come for us. It's good that while hunting for a watch, he was seriously injured, and therefore, until he is cured, we cannot wait for him. We have time to prepare. Plus, I'll do something and we'll be aware of his coming. I said, already fully understanding the work of the tracking device. Have you removed the tracking feature yet? Asked the grandfather. I'm just finishing. Now this method of searching for a clock will not work, and the device itself will inform us if there is one nearby. 
So, we will know if another robot or other mercenaries are sent for us. But all the same, by the blue light that the clock emits during my transformation, they will be able to find us, but only within a radius of 2 kilometers from my location. But now there will be no traces. And my radar will inform us about the guests when they come to Earth. So everything will be fine. I said, pleased with my work. With that finished, I went to the back of the bus and did my combination again, first ditto and then upgrade. Upgrade has soaked into the watch and removed the loophole. To do this, the device itself was really needed, there was a need to know a special trick in order to close the loss of energy correctly and so that no one would know about it. Having finished his work, the upgrade came back and was dispelled. Just at that moment, Grandpa Max caught my attention. Lex, I need you said the grandfather and stopped the RV. Approaching the driver's seat, through the windshield, I saw two trucks lying on the road ahead. Apparently, there was an accident. The bad news is that one of the trucks was carrying propane, so everything is on there, and one of the drivers is also stuck. Realizing what was happening, I did not hesitate to turn into a ghost freak. Having become intangible and invisible, I flew through the glass of the bus and went to the rescue of the stuck driver. Having reached the trucks, I went through the door and got into the cab to the driver, where I took him by the hands and made him also immaterial, carried him out and carried him to the side of the road. The driver himself was in complete shock and only looked around in horror. But he's safe. Having flown up to the fire, I became a heat blast and absorbed all the flame. After that he became four arms and took the trucks and carried them away from the road. While everyone was looking at me in shock, I managed to become invisible to the ghost freak again and returned to the bus. By the way, Zayscare woke up because I already felt the swarming in my head. Looks like he's trying to take control of me. Well, let him try. When my grandfather and Gwen saw that I was back, they just smiled at me and we drove on. Chapter 19, 18 Buzz Shock and Suit while we were driving, I decided to spend a little time on Gwen, so taking my laptop, I turned on some random movie and went to bed with the girl. We lay there for several hours until we arrived at our next destination. It was Sparksville. Grandpa said that he wanted to come here all summer. In fact, there is nothing that great here, it is just a tourist exhibit, the size of a city. It's just a city full of all sorts of stupid records. For example, the world's largest aquarium or the largest hot dog. I think it's just stupidity, but grandfather wanted it, so Gwen and I decided not to upset the old man. Plus it was a chance to spend some time alone with Gwen. This is, one might even say, our first date. The place is certainly not very good, but there's nothing you can do about it. Grandpa left us alone and went to book a motel room. When he was far enough away, I asked, while playing with my eyebrows. Well, Gwen, do you want to go on a date? Gwen blushed and nodded with a smile. It's good, it's a pity of course the place is not very good, but I think there is at least something interesting here too. Plus, I think we can arrange our perfect date in New York City. I said and took Gwen's hand. And we went to the first exhibit. It was a jackalope exhibit. Jackalope is such a mythical horned hare. It is unclear whether it exists or not. If this was my first world, I would confidently say no. But in this world it is incomprehensible. Maybe this is an alien, but who knows? Having handed the tickets to the controller, who was also the mayor of the city, we went inside. The exhibition was clearly fake, as there were only stuffed hares, with badly attached deer antlers. In general, nothing interesting. Then we went to the following exhibits. After a couple of hours, we almost finished our tour of the city. Despite my some doubts, Gwen and I were able to have a good time. We took quite a few photos and had a lot of fun. We were now entering the last remaining attraction. It looked like an ordinary barn. Inside there was just a huge heap of all sorts of signs forbidding you to touch or photograph the exhibit. When we got to the end of the barn, there was a huge banner saying this is. Then the banner was raised and the exhibit itself appeared behind it. 
It was a giant ball of rubber strips. Gwen was clearly disappointed, and I knew what his secret was. The alien of the Nozadinian's race was locked inside. A very nasty aliens. They always love to riot and joke, but the jokes themselves often end in serious injuries. When the mayor left us alone with the rubber ball, Gwen asked. What is this joke? Were you and me played? No, something is wrong here. Wait a second, I want to check something. I said and went to the ball. Coming close to him, I put my hand on the ball. When I touched it, the Omnitrix flashed yellow. The yellow light swept across the globe and then disappeared. This means that the analysis has been completed successfully. Did you find something? Gwen asked curiously. Yes. It looks like some alien is trapped inside the ball. Now, we need to wait for the Omnitrix to finish processing, and we will find out everything. I said, pointing to the clock, which was still yellow. Five minutes later, the Omnitrix glowed blue again. Pressing the button, I turned on the Omnitrix, after which I began to turn the dial. When I reached the new alien, I saw a silhouette like a battery with arms and legs. It was Buzz Shock. I thought so. I said when I noticed that Gwen was already losing her patience. Well, what did you find out? Gwen asked, looking at the Omnitrix. The Nozadinian is locked inside. I read about them in the plumber's database. A very common race. They know how to control, absorb and become electricity. Very unpleasant types. I said, wincing. Maybe we will release him then? Gwen asked with a little pity. No, not worth it. If he escapes, he will destroy the entire city. And we will be to blame. In addition, they do not have a very developed mind, in general, everyone considers them to be pests. So in the ball it will be best for him, neither he will harm anyone, nor will anyone do anything to him. We can't help you anyway. Let's go to the motel, grandpa must have been waiting for us. I said and went to the exit. Wen thought a little, looked at the ball again and followed me. When we found my grandfather, he was already in our room. The number, however, like the whole city, was strange. All the furniture was bolted to the wall, even the bed. How do we sleep? Okay, does not matter, since there is no other number, you have to sleep like that. After that we had dinner at a cafe and went to the side. Underscore. June 10th, 2010. Tetrax gave me an idea. Namely, make a suit. I don't want everyone to know me by sight. What I don't want to do is become a public hero. If there is a suit with a mask, then I can protect my secret. Plus, if you make a durable suit, it will also be good protection. And of course, most importantly, I will look cool in a suit. Deciding to make my idea a reality, after breakfast, I said. Grandpa, I have something to do. Can I leave for a couple of days? Something serious? Max asked anxiously. No, I just got an idea. I still can't get her out of my head. So I want to go to the lab for a couple of days. I honestly admitted. In general, you are as always, huh? Okay, you can go. But I only give you two days. Will you come back before we get to New York? I think yes. Just enough time. Well, I'll go tell Gwen. Good luck. I said and went to Gwen. Be careful. Said the grandfather, goodbye. When I found Gwen, I told her that I would be gone for two days. Of course she wanted with me, but I persuaded her to stay with my grandfather. Goodbye gave her a kiss. From this she melted and let me go on all four sides. Taking the remains of the Vilgax robot from the bus, I turned into an XLR-8 and rushed off to the laboratory. Arriving at my Lex cave, the first thing I did was turn on the computer and start designing the costume. Morgana helped me with this. My plan is for the suit to be made up of the strongest and lightest metals in the galaxy. The legs, arms, chest and back will have the strongest protection. 
I'll make the mask with a visor and of course access to Morgana. I took the visor from the robot Vilgax, it is very good and strong, it only needs to be slightly altered. Basically stuffing my glasses into my helmet. The helmet will be the lightest, but this does not detract from its protection. It will also fold like Iron Man helmet. I also added the ability to use energy shields like on spaceships. And not only to protect myself, but also for whoever I want to protect. Energy will come from Tatanite crystals, which will be crammed into the suit wherever possible. The design itself took me 5 hours. I have now checked all the materials available. I had everything except the special metal I needed to protect my joints and weak spots. This metal is very flexible and tough. But it is incredibly rare in solar system, fortunately, I know where to get it. Also, there were no special, small cables through which the energy would be redistributed throughout the suit. But they can be bought in the underground city. Before leaving, I launched a special apparatus that will create the details I need. It's kind of like a 3D printer, but much more powerful and advanced. I put it together and improved it myself. Also I have not forgotten to stock up on Tatanite for trading. My first stop was in the Bellwoods underground city. As a result, I had to spend 4 hours to find these cables. Then he begged the seller to sell them for another hour. Everyone needs these cables, although they are not very rare, there is an obvious shortage of them on Earth. I had to pay really big money, but I was still very lucky with Diamond Head, so it cost nothing to me. When I got back to base, I laid down the cables and started up the machine again for the next batch of parts. By this time, the day was already over. Underscore. June 11, 2010. My second stop was the Forever Knights Warehouse. In fact, I have known for a long time all the hints and bases of this secret organization. Morgana found them. But I could not get to them before, without the Omnitrix. And after receiving the watch, there was simply not enough time. The trouble is that I did not know in which storage the metal I needed so much was. So I had to check everything. I did a simple combination, XLR8 to arrive at base, Ghost Freak to check everything. I found what I needed, only on the fifth attempt. This storage facility was located in Alaska. I was very annoyed with all these searches, so I took all the metal they had, only 10 kilograms. Really rare. Despite all my speed, I returned to base only for lunch. All other details were already ready, so I had to deal with the most difficult and important. By remelting metals. I turned into a heat blast, took pieces of metal, melted them with my enormous temperature, until I destroyed all unnecessary impurities. Then from what happened, with the help of telekinesis, he created a super strong and flexible thread. It will go to protect places where solid pieces of metal cannot be used. This lesson took me five more hours. Later, I became myself again and with the help of the alien forge created the main protection of the suit. I finished doing this only by the next day. Underscore. June 12, 2010. Having finished preparing all the details, I finally checked them and made sure they were working properly. The final work has now begun. I turned into upgrade and used my fluid body to put all the parts together to get my suit. When the suit was assembled, I added the entire tandonite in special sections. And now, the suit was completely ready. Having become a man, I put it on and began to check. It turned out to be very convenient and lightweight. Only 5 kilograms. And his protection is simply divine. It can easily withstand a missile strike, and it will also remain intact. After making sure everything was working, I ordered Morgana to fold her suit. After my signal, the whole suit disappeared and folded into a small backpack, 30 by 30 centimeters. This backpack clings directly to the clothes, after which, through Morgana, I give the order and the suit appears on me. Having finished with everything, I left the base and went to the family. I intentionally left a bug in the RV so that I always know where they are. It was already 11 am. Are you finished? 
Asked me grandfather when he saw that I was back. Yes, I did everything. I replied wearily. And what was that? Gwen asked curiously. Without saying anything, I ordered Morgana to open the suit. Instantly, I was wearing a white and black metallic superhero suit with glowing blue elements. When creating it, I was inspired by Max Steel's costumes, but mine turned out to be more futuristic and, in my opinion, cooler. Very cool. Gwen said. It looks like I'm not the only one who thinks so. Let's talk later. I really want to sleep. Taking off my suit, I said and went to bed. Chapter 20, 19. New York City. The Omnitrix signal woke me up. Getting out of bed, I activated the clock and turning the dial noticed a new alien. I don't know why, but the sandbox became available to me. This alien was not featured in the original animated series, but was mentioned once by Ben's son from the future. The main power of the alien, as the name implies, is the creation and management of sand. It is actually a very powerful alien if used wisely. A great example of this is the villain from the Marvel comics or Gara from Naruto. The main weakness of this alien is pretty obvious. This is water. One must be careful not to use it near a water source. It is not clear where it came from, but in fact, I'm even glad. I will say it again, but the more aliens are available, the better. Morgana, is there any information about this alien in the orderly's base? I asked my favorite artificial intelligence. There is something, but not much. This alien, a representative of the Sandarian race from the planet Sandora, which is located in the constellation of Cancer. The whole planet is one huge desert, with only a small number of oases. There is also a description of the basic abilities of this type, but I think this is understandable. That's all. Morgana told me. Really not a lot, but at least something. Although the alias sandbox I do not like. For such a worthy hero, it's too stupid a nickname. I will not deviate from the classics and will simply call it the Sandman. Yes, that would be better. I said to myself, finally nodding at my decision. After completing my watch check, I walked to the front of the bus and sat down opposite Gwen. What time is it? I asked. It's already 10 o'clock in the evening. Gwen answered, looking up from the book she was reading. I slept well. Are we coming to New York soon? I asked the grandfather who was driving. Drive for about half an hour. Max answered me. Good. So why did you make yourself a suit? Gwen asked, putting the book down. I don't want to shine my face. For me, and so half of the galaxy to hunt, because of the Omnitrix. I don't want everyone to know who the Omnitrix belongs to. Plus, protection is never superfluous. This suit will take a tank shot. I said. I see, will you make a suit for me? Gwen asked hopefully. I can. In fact, it was necessary for a long time. Protection definitely won't hurt you. Yes, and I will be calmer. After thinking a little, I said, and then added, but I will make it not so strong, but it will increase your strength and speed. Looks more like an exoskeleton than a suit. Thanks a lot. Gwen said with a happy smile. She clearly wanted to kiss me, but stopped because of the presence of her grandfather. Then we continued to talk on abstract topics until we arrived in the city. Grandpa decided to surprise us and brought us to a four-star hotel where we will stay for one night. Gwen was just delighted with this, because it was possible, at last, to take a full and decent bath, and not the ones that were in motels. Plus, there was a jacuzzi and a sauna, just a girl's dream. Of course, I could remodel my grandfather's mobile home and turn it into an ultra-modern mobile base with all the amenities, but grandfather loves his old bus too much with all its flaws, so I decided not to change anything in it. Grandpa rented a large room for us with three beds. Gwen wanted a private room, of course, but it was too expensive. Although I offered to pay, my grandfather was too stubborn and refused it. 
I didn't really care, because I really wanted to sleep. I didn't have enough time on the bus to get enough sleep. Therefore, entering the room, I only had time to take a shower, after which I immediately fell asleep. Underscore. June 13, 2010. In the morning we had breakfast at the hotel restaurant, after which we went to spa treatments. In fact, it was very good. As if all the fatigue was removed by hand. I've been very stressed lately about this whole clock story. Of course, I knew everything that was going to happen, but you can never be 100% sure of something. Therefore, I was always waiting for some kind of trick. Also, there is always not enough time to implement your ideas with the Omnitrix. But thanks to the spa, I was finally able to relax and let go of my worries. If 10-year-old Ben coped with everything, then I, almost 16-year-old forehead, and even with cheats from the judge of the gods, can definitely handle it. After a well-deserved rest, we went for a walk around the city, went on a couple of excursions, and visited the museum. Generally had a good time. Towards evening, my grandfather, tired of walking, decided to return to the bus, and Gwen and I left alone. Gwen was clearly very happy about that. Well, let's go on a date, as you promised. You still owe me, because you left me for two whole days. The first part of Gwen said with a smile, but the second is clearly with a threat. Of course, I will do whatever you want. I said with a smile and we again went for a walk around the city. First we ate a couple of hot dogs, then went to Central Park. This time it was more like a date. We even held hands and kissed a couple of times. Hey, look, isn't this an arcade game? Let's go in. Said Gwen and dragged me into the arcade, where in the original the main characters met Kevin. Damn it. In fact, I didn't want to go here. I never liked Kevin. Maybe in the future he corrected himself, but as a child he was still that shit. I didn't want to run into him at all and make him my enemy or friend. Let me change history with this, but it's still my world, as Elsa said, and I will do what I want. Well, okay, if meeting Kevin I will stay away from him. And I will never allow it to touch my Omnitrix. Will break more, God forbid. I myself have not yet fully figured it out. Having entered the arcade, we started playing slot machines. We've been here for half an hour and I haven't seen anyone like Kevin. Maybe it will carry it all the same. Just as I thought about it, the slot machine I was playing swallowed my tokens. Bastard. I could not resist and hit on the machine. Then a woman's voice rang out from behind me. You're right, there are smelly machines here. Turning around, I saw a beautiful girl of 16. She had long black hair and dark brown eyes. Her figure was just awful. Breast of the third size, wasp waist and curvy hips. In general, just a hot beauty. Looking at her closely, I understood. I really hit it. Underscore. Ashley POV. My name is Catherine Ashley Levin. But I prefer to simply be called Ashley. I am 16 years old. My parents' names are Amanda and Devin Levin. My father died when I was five years old, but my mother told me about him. He was a real hero. He worked as a space plumber, essentially a space policeman. But he died at work, and my mother did not tell me the reason. When I was seven years old, my mother remarried. My stepfather's name is Harvey Hackett. In fact, he is not a bad person, he takes care of my mother. But I don't like him. Although he tried to love me, he failed. Since then, we have had a cold war with him. Despite this, though, he still cared about me. But that was before I awakened my superpowers inherited from my father. I can absorb energy, mainly electricity, and use it. My mom and Harvey don't like the fact that I had superpowers. Because of this, we constantly fought. They didn't want me to use my powers, and I loved that. I felt that it was just natural for me and I needed to use my powers more often. One day, the quarrel got out of control. Ashley, I order you, don't use your powers anymore. My mother shouted at me. But why? 
I love the feeling of power. Why are you forbidding me? A loud cry, I asked. It may be dangerous. She said reluctantly. What's so dangerous? It's natural for me. Or is it something to do with your father? I could not resist and asked. When I asked my mom, she slapped me in the face and said aggressively. Never mention your father. You will never use your powers again. I forbid you to do this, like your mother. After the blow and her words, I could no longer tolerate it and ran away from home. It was a month and a half ago. Since then I have been living in an abandoned metro station and I have settled well there. And all my free time, I spend in the local arcade. And so, I thought it would be another boring day in the arcade when I saw it. A guy about my age. He had black curly hair and incredibly beautiful dark blue eyes. He wore glasses and two strange bracelets on his arms. He was dressed in a blue shirt and black jeans. Despite the fact that he was very handsome, something else attracted me. Something drew me to him. It was as if something inside me longed for him. As soon as I saw him, I was struck directly by lightning. Maybe this is love at first sight? So, I stared at him for about five minutes, after which I decided to come up and get to know him. He just had problems with the arcade game, and I can help him, and at the same time I will show my best side. Chapter 21, 20. Levin. Looking at the female version of Kevin, I wondered how it happened. About the fact that she is 16 years old, instead of 11, I can still understand. But why is she such a hot beauty? Hopefully, she's not the same as the original Kevin and didn't get a headache. It would be a pity to send such beauty to the null void. But first we need to talk and get to know her better, I have an idea how to fix it, if that. Something I'm dull today, I've been staring at her for two minutes. And she is not far from me, she is also staring. So what did you say? Having come to the senses, I asked. What? Oh yes. I say the automates are stupid here, they always swallow tokens, and the workers don't even care about that. Do you want to help? Girl Kevin asked me. How can you help? I asked for appearance. And it's so clear how she will help. Look. You owe me. She said and touched her hand to the video game. A charge of electricity passed through her hand, because of this, the machine was short-circuited and he spat out all the tokens. Electricity management? With a raised eyebrow, I asked calmly. Generally, absorbing any energy and using it after. On the machine, said the girl. At this point, Wen came up to us. Realizing that my reaction was too calm, the female version of Kevin asked in shock. What is this all your reaction? Where is admiration or fear? Anything? We've seen stranger things too. And we ourselves are not quite ordinary people. Gwen said casually. Here, behind, we heard footsteps. When I turned around, I saw several boogie from 15 to 18 years old. What did they forget at that age in the arcade, I do not understand. Seeing them Femme Kevin began to back away. Long time no see. Where are you going girly? Do you want to charge the batteries? Said, apparently, their leader. He's still a freak. Why does he need a blue mohawk, I also don't understand. Your acquaintances? I asked. Still, even though this is not the Kevin I know, I still don't trust her. Although I am very sympathetic to her. They saw me use my abilities a couple of times. Now they want to force me to use them at ATMs. But I do not want. She said seriously. Boom. Looks like she's not Kevin at the age of 10 after all. You need to stop being prejudiced against her. Take her. Said the blue mohawk. Looks like he's tired of enduring our conversations. Get out of here. I will delay them. Said Femkevin and launched an electric attack at one of the thugs. 
But then she got on another dude with her fists. Apparently, the charge is over. Will we help? I asked Gwen. Let's. She seems to me to be a pretty good person, despite the terrible taste in clothes. Said Gwen and creating a magic disc threw it at one of the bandits. Here's the devil. I was gone only two days, and she already knows how to make discs. But I didn't even explain how it's done. This is what is called talent. Hey. I dress well. Shouted girl Kevin at the words of Gwen. And most FBK, female version of Kevin, already needed help. She was still able to knock out two of the thugs, but now she was cornered. Therefore, I decided to help her using my telekinesis. And then something I rarely use it. My magic discs are still too unstable, I can kill these bandits. I don't want to get my hands dirty about them. And to use the Omnitrix against such freaks is not come I L foe. Using a shocker is just boring. Therefore, raising my hands and using telekinesis, I pulled the two bugs to my hands. Catching from the neck, I banged their heads together. From this they passed out with foam at the mouth. By this point, Wen had knocked out three more. There are only three left. I lifted them with telekinesis and hit the ceiling with force. Having released them, they fell from a 4 meter height. Probably they broke something. Well, I don't care about these garbage. FBK looked at me and Gwen in shock and with her mouth wide open. Well, here we finished. Let's get out of here before someone calls the police. I said and went to the exit. Gwen followed me right away while FBK stood a little, looked at all the bandits and followed us. After passing a couple of blocks in silence, FBK finally broke down and asked. So who are you? My name is Alexander Tennyson, I prefer to be called Lex. And this is my cousin Gwen. I introduced myself in a calm voice. Nice to meet you. Said Gwen and waved her hand a little. Oh, yes. My name is Catherine Ashley Levin. You can just call me Ashley, nice to meet you. Said FBK, that is, Ashley. I'm used to just calling it that. Wait. So how did you do it? Remembering what she wanted to ask, said Ashley. Well, everyone has their own abilities. For example, you can absorb energy. Gwen is learning to use magic. I also have strength. I said casually. Magic? There is no magic. Ashley said with conviction, snorting a little. This is the one who knows how to control electricity. Gwen said sarcastically, pointing out obvious problems with logic. It is truth too. Ashley said, finally calming down. Wait. I said, and stopped to add afterwards, did you say Levin? Do you know Devin Levin? Finally, I decided to start this conversation. I hope my plan works. Yes. This is my father. He died when I was five years old. With a not very happy face, said Ashley. Was he a space plumber? I asked again. Yes. How do you know about this? Already with some threat in her voice asked Ashley. My grandfather was also a plumber. And he told me about your father as a child. I said the truth. And so it was. What did he tell you? The girl grabbed me by the collar and began to shake. Let him go. While you shake him, he will not be able to answer you. Said Gwen, trying to help me. Ashley was clearly embarrassed by her actions and quickly let go of me. Sorry, I just don't know much about him. My mom didn't want to talk about him. All I know about him is that he died while working as an orderly. Ashley said shyly. Nothing, I understand. Let's go to my grandfather. He will tell you everything, he knows more than me. You can go, can't you? I suggested. Yes I can. Said happy Ashley. Let's go then. It's not far here. Only three blocks. I said and went forward. 
As we walked, I managed to read Ashley's thoughts. Despite the fact that my telepathy is weak, I was enough for one person. From what I've learned, Ashley really doesn't look like Kevin at all. She even goes to school. She is a nice and kind-hearted girl. But she has no friends at all. She is a clear outcast. Although it is unclear why she is so normal compared to Kevin. I have a couple of ideas. Or it's because she's a girl. Or due to the fact that she discovered her abilities at a later age. Most likely both options. She hasn't been using her power for very long, so it didn't get hit in the head like Kevin did. Plus, due to the fact that she is a girl, she matured faster and did not succumb to her strength as easily as a 10-year-old boy. In fact, I'm glad she's a good girl. There will be fewer problems. Ten minutes later we reached the bus. Before entering, I said. Wait here, Grandpa is probably asleep, because it's already quite late. I will wake him up and explain the whole situation. At my words, the girls only nodded. But I saw Ashley trembling with impatience. When I got on the bus, I saw my grandfather sleeping. He snored as usual. Grandpa wake up. I said, pushing Max in the shoulder. Mmm. Lex. What time is it? Something happened? Asked, still sleepy, grandfather. It's 10 in the evening. And no, nothing happened. Gwen and I met someone in the arcade. She wants to talk to you. I said. Who is this? Asked the grandfather, still not fully awake. Her name is Ashley Levin. She is the daughter of your old partner Devin Levin. I said. My grandfather immediately woke up from my words and sat up straight. He almost hit me on the nose. Are you sure? Max asked very seriously. Absolutely. I checked. And she also knows practically nothing about him. Looks like her mother decided to shut Ashley off from all this. But recently, she has acquired the abilities of an Osmosian. They had a very serious fight about this and Ashley ran away from home. For a month and a half she has been cuckolding at an abandoned metro station. I told, received from the head of Ashley, a story. Are abilities already affecting her mind? Grandpa asked seriously. Only if a little. There is just a little thirst to use them. Already practically cannot do without them. But it's okay if we can help. There is still plenty of time. I said. Grandpa, after my words, clearly relaxed. But not very much. It is clearly very difficult for him now. All the same, the story there is murky. Okay. Call her here, I'll tell her everything. Asked Max. I nodded and went to call Ashley and Gwen. Serious conversation ahead. Chapter 22, 21. History. Opening the door, I called the girls. Gwen walked in first, followed by Ashley, a little nervous. Ashley, this is my grandfather Max Tennyson. He is a former space plumber and was once your father's partner. I introduced my grandfather, and then did the opposite, Grandpa, this is Ashley Levin, Devon's daughter. Nice to meet you, Ashley. Said the grandfather with a smile. Nice, too, Mr. Tennyson. Can you tell me about your father? Ashley asked, embarrassed and hopeful. Certainly can. But first, let me know what you know about Devon. Sitting on a chair, Grandfather. All I know is that he was a space plumber and died during the mission. Also, that I got superpowers from him. Also crouched down, said Ashley. Right. We have been working together for eight years. Said the grandfather sadly. What happened to him? Ashley asked. This was my last mission. Your father and I tried to escape from a dangerous criminal. His name was Ragnarok. He stole the energy of the stars and sold at a high price. Devon managed to steal the key of Ragnarok's ship, 
where he kept all of his energy reserves. During the chase, Ragnarok was able to damage our ship and we were stuck in space, after which Ragnarok was able to infiltrate our ship. Devon had to abuse his powers to give us time. I tried to stop Ragnarok, but no weapon worked. Said the grandfather and let out a tired exhale. And what happened next? Ashley asked in a low voice. Next, I tried to use the null void projector to lock Ragnarok there, but he prevented me. Ragnarok shot me with an attack that would have killed me for sure, but Devon protected me with his body. Seeing a chance, wasting no time, I used the projector and sent it to Dimension Zero. Said the grandfather, closing his eyes. What happened to my father? Asked already crying Ashley. He died in my arms. I asked him why he protected me, because he had a little daughter and a wife, and he answered me that it was not so bad to die protecting the earth. Before he died, he asked me to tell you that he would always love you. Said Grandpa, wiping away a tear that had appeared. During the story, the grandfather grew old before our eyes. It's hard for him all the same. What happened then? Asked sad Ashley, still crying. I called for reinforcements and was able to get to Earth. After that there was a funeral with all the honors. During the funeral, I tried to talk to Amanda, but she did not listen to me and said that she never wanted to see me again. After that, she left with you from Bellwood, where you lived before. I haven't seen you since. And I myself have retired. A couple of months after that, Lex's parents died in a car accident. It was only thanks to your father that I was able to take care of my grandson. I will always remember this. Said the grandfather, in my opinion, too solemnly. Why didn't mom tell me about it? Ashley asked, practically sobbing. Most likely she wanted to protect you. She thinks your father died because of his work as a plumber. She just didn't want that kind of fate for you. It was a banal fear for you. Said, before that, I was silent. But in my opinion, it was a little silly. At least part of it should have been said. I said again. What do you mean? Ashley asked, wiping away her tears. You see, Ashley, you are, like your father, an osmosis. This is a very rare race, the main feature of which is the absorption and use of different materials. I told. And? Why did my mother have to tell me about this? Ashley asked, confused. She should have warned you of your strength. You see, the Osmosians are known to go mad and go mad because of their strength. Your father was skilled enough at this to use his powers without fear of losing control. But unlike him, you have not been trained by the plumbers and you have no control at all. I said seriously. So that's why my mother forbade me to use my powers. Finally grasping the whole point, said Ashley. Most likely. But it won't help you. You already feel addicted to strength, right? Have you ever had moments when you felt omnipotent? I asked, knowing the answer perfectly well. Yes, it happened a couple of times. But I thought it was natural for me. And thoughts of omnipotence, I quickly discarded. Ashley said with fear, clearly anticipating something bad. You need to learn to control your powers. You are right, it is your nature, but you cannot give in to it. It is you who should use your powers, not they you. I said, and then continued, your mom only made things worse. Because of her prohibition, the addiction could only get worse. And you could have lost control of power faster. Most likely, she simply did not know about it. She needed to ask her grandfather or other plumbers for help, but she was too stubborn. Although it is also possible to understand. And now what I can do? I don't want to go crazy. Asked to frighten Ashley. You're lucky you met us. Another six months and you would definitely succumb to your strength, maybe more, after all, you have a strong will. Grandpa and I can teach you control. Really, Grandpa? I asked. Yes. In fact, I know how Devin trained. So I can help. Said the grandfather and sent me a look that we need to talk. 
I can help too. I read about the osmosions in the plumber's database. There it was written about three types of absorption. The first is those who absorb energy. Like you and your father. Second, the absorption of matter. This is actually the safest view. And the third is the absorption of DNA. Such osmosions always go crazy. So don't try to do that. I said with a warning. Understood. Ashley replied, swallowing in fear. Now let's sleep. It's late, we'll continue tomorrow. I said, clapping my hands. Then I'll go. Said Ashley and got up from her seat. Not. You will stay here. There is enough room for everyone. You needn't sleep on the street. Said the grandfather in a voice that does not tolerate objections. Ashley took it surprisingly quickly. And we all went to bed. Before going to bed, I thought about the story with Devon. I knew it was all nonsense, of course. No Devon Levin even existed. This whole story is put into the head of Max and Ashley's mother, a former nurse named Cervantes. This is all one huge experiment. But I decided not to change anything. After all, Cervantes will not appear soon. During this time, we will be able to help Ashley and it will be easier for her to accept. Although there is a possibility that this is all true, and this is where I am wrong. But for now, it's best to leave it as it is. So for now, I decided to just go to sleep. Chapter 23, 22. Departure. June 14, 2010. Grandpa woke me up at 6 a.m. and said he wanted to talk to me. When I finally woke up, I followed my grandfather out into the street. So you want us to take Ashley with us? Asked Grandpa. Yes. She needs help anyway. And we can provide it. Plus, it will help you. I confirmed. What do you mean? Max asked uncomprehendingly. I can see how hard this story with Devon was given to you. You still feel guilty. This is your chance to help in some way. And atone for your guilt. Do you need it? I said sympathetically. After my words, Grandfather let out a heavy sigh. I sometimes forget how smart you are. You're right, I need it. I want it. But that can be dangerous. After all, Vilgax is after us. Said Max, while saying the right words. It's actually good. Combat experience will come in handy for her. But if anything, we can always protect her. In case of emergency, we will return her home. I said. Here you are also right. Having thought a little, said the grandfather. Plus, Ashley could use this trip. After all, she ran away from home. We will help her solve her problems not only with control of abilities, but also problems in her relationship with her mother. I added. It is truth too. And what do you want to do now? Asked the grandfather, agreeing with me. This is her mother's home address. Go to her, talk, explain the whole situation and take things. I'll talk to Ashley myself. I said and gave the address of their home, which I learned from Ashley's memory. Taking the address, Grandfather sighed doom and went to hail a taxi. I returned to the bus. By this time, Gwen and Ashley had already woken up. Ashley, can I talk to you? I asked. Yes, of course, Lex. What do you want? Approaching me, asked Ashley. Do you want to come with us? I asked immediately. What? Are you serious? Ashley asked in shock. Yes. Grandpa has already gone to your mother to ask permission. I said with a nod. Are you sure? We hardly know each other. Ashley asked quietly, looking down. Yes. After all, it was only thanks to your father that my grandfather was able to take care of me after my parents died. We are your debtors. 
I said and smiled. Lex is right about that. We owe you. Moreover, since we can help, why not help? Gwen, who came up, said with a smile. Ashley burst into tears at our words and rushed to hug us. She cried for about five minutes, thanks to us all the time. When Ashley finally calmed down, I decided to continue the conversation. Now we just have to wait for Grandpa Max and we will go further. While we have time, I think Gwen and I need to tell you more about us. After all, we know almost everything about you, and you know nothing about us. I said. Gwen nodded at my words. I think I'll start first. As you already know, my name is Lex. Full name is Alexander Benjamin Tennyson. My parents' names is Carl and Olivia. My mother was a famous scientist. I got my brains and looks from her. As you already know, they died when I was five years old. My grandfather raised me. I graduated from high school two weeks ago. My hobby is inventing new things. Favorite food, pizza and Russian kitchen. Look like that's it. I said. Then, now I am. My name is Gwendolyn Catherine Tennyson. I am 15 years old. My parents' names are Frank and Natalie, they are the most ordinary people. Hobbies are reading and drawing. Favorite food is sushi. Gwen told herself. What about your abilities? Ashley asked. Well, it's a matter of our origin. We, like you, are not really human. Our grandmother, grandfather Max's wife, is an alien. She is anodite, essentially a magical race. So Gwen and I were able to awaken our legacy. Now we are trying to learn magic. My mother also had an alien in her family, it is because of this that I have high intelligence and telekinesis. I said and pulled up my phone that was lying on the bedside table. Cool. Will she teach me magic? Ashley asked excited. It's not all that simple. We ourselves still know little about this. But, in principle, you can absorb some mana and then use magic. But don't try to do it now, it could harm you and us. I said, after thinking a little. It's a pity. Well, I'm going with you because I want to learn how to control my strength. So let's see what happens. Ashley said sensibly. By the way, about this. You see, since you are traveling with us, we must also tell you a secret. Look. I said and touched the bracelet on my right hand. From my touch, ripples went through the bracelet and a real kind of omnitrix appeared. Wow, what is this? Ashley asked, surprised. This watch is called the omnitrix. They give me the ability to transform into different aliens and use their powers. Like this. I told him with a blue flash turned into wrath, then into XLR8 and then became myself again. Great. Let me have a look. Said the shot Ashley and pulled her hands to the Omnitrix. Don't even think about touching him. I said and slapped her hands. Why? Ashley said resentfully, rubbing her hand. He's incredibly dangerous for you. If you accidentally absorb the power of the Omnitrix, then, firstly, you will lose your human form, and secondly, you will ride with a roof. You will certainly get incredible power, but do you need it? I said seriously. Ashley looked fearfully at the Omnitrix and sat back. No. Do not. Ashley said in a hoarse voice. Exactly. So be careful, as I told you, absorbing DNA is 100% chance go crazy. Even if you completely take control of your powers, still never do it. In an instructive tone, I said. Yes. Ashley said. So, where did I stop? Oh yes. I myself cannot take the Omnitrix off my hand. Besides, he seems to be under our protection. One vil alien hunt for hours, Vilgax. So being with us can be dangerous. But on the other hand, you will get combat experience. So, I ask again, are you sure you want to stay with us? In a serious voice, I asked. 
Yes. I want to stay with you. Ashley said with determination, ignoring the dangers. Very good. Since this is the case, I'll teach you one trick. As I said, osmosions can absorb energy, matter and DNA. If it is by no means possible to absorb DNA, then things are different with energy and matter. I will help you with energy later, together with my grandfather. But matter is the safest way to use your powers. Here you are. I said and gave Ashley a handful of coins. Why do I need it? The girl asked doubtfully. I'll tell you now. Clench the coins into a fist. Then breathe evenly and concentrate. Now do what you usually do with electricity. Absorb. Ashley followed my instructions and began to absorb coins. After a couple of minutes, her hand turned copper and silver colors. Well done, everything is correct. I praised. Ashley lost concentration because of my words and her hand returned to normal. Wow. It's harder than electricity, but I feel a lot lighter. As if some pressure was gone. Ashley said enthusiastically, looking at her hand. This pressure was influenced by the dependence of your power. When you can completely cover your body with some material, you will increase your strength, speed, stamina, and durability. Plus, you can create weapons from parts of your body. You will also get some of the properties of these materials. For example, the bouncing of rubber or the hardness of a stone. Now the main thing is to learn how to hold the cover for a long time, at least on one hand. Then you move on. Until then, train. Grandpa should be back soon. I said and looked at my watch. It was almost 8 a.m. It's time for breakfast. Underscore. Max POV. Half an hour later I arrived at Amanda's house. I really don't want to go. I feel terrible. But this is my chance to make amends. I must do it. Sighing a couple more times, I pressed the bell. Who's there? After a couple of minutes, a woman's voice was heard from behind the door. Max Tennyson. Restraining nervousness, I said. The door opened and I saw Amanda, a little older. Seeing me, she immediately became serious and a little aggressive. What are you doing here, Max? Argued Amanda in a harsh voice. We need to talk. Can I come in? I asked. Good. But fast. Said Amanda and let me in. Sitting in the living room, Amanda offered me tea, but I refused. There was a serious conversation ahead. What are you doing in New York, Max? Sitting opposite me, asked Amanda. I'm passing through here. I am on a summer trip with my grandchildrens. I honestly said. Clear. So what do you want from me? Getting to the point, she asked. While walking around the city, my grandchildrens met Ashley. And they brought her to me. Ashley? Where is she? She's all right? Amanda snapped at me, inundating me with questions. She's all right. She is now with my grandchildrens. Lately she lived in an abandoned metro station. I said, trying to calm her down. I'll take her right away. Said Amanda and was about to run away from home. Wait, let me finish. I told everything about Devon. I admitted. What? What did you do? With an angry cry, asked Amanda. I had no choice. She wanted to know everything. Plus, she needs help. Trying to calm her down, I said. What do you mean? Amanda asked uncomprehendingly. It's because of her abilities. She needs to learn how to control them. Not. I don't want her to use them at all. Amanda said in an unchallengeable voice. It's not an option. Devin didn't tell you the details of his power, did he? I asked, suspecting the answer. Not. She admitted. 
You see, Ashley and Devon's abilities have a profound effect on the mind. You need to learn how to use them correctly, otherwise you can go crazy and start mad. And if you prohibit the use of her power, it will only get worse, because this is her nature. I told everything. I didn't know. Amanda turned pale at once in a choked voice. You noticed that after the awakening of abilities, she began to change? I asked. Yes. Previously, she was not so violent. She would never run away from home, especially for a month and a half. I thought it was just teenage. Amanda said in a low voice. It's all because of her strength. But I can help her. I've seen Devon train before, so I know how to help her. Plus, my grandson read about people like them in the plumber's database, so he can help too. I said, in a convinced voice. What do you suggest? Amanda asked, more gently. Let me take her with us on the journey, until the end of summer. During this time, we will help her. She will spend time with my grandchildrens, she needs the company of her age. Plus, they're not ordinary kids either. It will be much better that way. I suggested. Amanda listened to me and was silent for a few minutes. Good. I allow. But if something happens to her, I will kill you myself. Amanda practically growled threateningly. I will protect her, even at the cost of my life. I swore. Okay, I believe you. Now I will pack her things and we will go. I want to say goodbye to her. Said Amanda and went into another room. In half an hour it was ready and we took a taxi to my RV. After another half hour we were there. Just then, Lex walked up to the RV with a box of pizza. Oh. You've already returned. But I bought breakfast. Let's go inside. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Levin. My name is Lex. Lex said and opened the door for us. Underscore. Ashley POV. Lex left for breakfast and Gwen read a book. I, all this time, trained with a cover of matter. I can already hold it for three minutes on one hand without any problems. Fifteen minutes after Lex left, the bus door opened and Mr. Tennyson entered with a suitcase. And right after that, my mom and Lex. Mom? What are you doing here? I asked in shock. Without saying anything, my mother rushed to hug me and began to cry. Forgive me, my girl. I missed you so much. I was just afraid that the same thing would happen to you as it did to your father. I didn't know that my actions would only make things worse. Said my mother and continued to cry. From her words, I also burst into tears. By this time, no one was left on the bus except us. After that we cried for another half hour and talked about different things. Then when we calmed down, my mother said. I give you permission to go with Max. He is a good person and will be able to take care of you. And you will finally have friends. Mom said with a smile. Thank you, Mom. I said sobbing. Tell me, do you blame Mr. Tennyson for the death of your father? Not. Never blamed. I was just very angry, because I never wanted Devon to work as a plumber. But it's not Max's fault, Devon chose his own destiny. Don't blame Max either, because now he can help you. And behave yourself well. Said my mother, stroking my hair. Okay, mom. I said obediently, and hugged her. After that we talked a little more, and my mother went home. After she left, Mr. Tennyson got behind the wheel and we drove out of town. Chapter 24, 23. First Training. We left New York and had been on the road for two hours. During this time, we communicated and got to know Ashley better. In parallel, she trained the Shroud of Matter. At this moment, we just arrived at a deserted place. There was only a field within a radius of 20 kilometers. I asked Grandpa to stop here so we could train Ashley for a bit and also continue mastering magic. 
After getting off the bus, I helped grandpa get a deck chair so that he could rest and look after us. After that, together with Gwen and Ashley, we went further into the field. So. It's a good place here. Now, Ashley, how long can you support the veil? I asked. About six minutes, if I am fully focused and do nothing else. And if I move, then only four minutes. Ashley boasted. This is very good for just a few hours of training. Now let's move on to the next stage. All this time you were holding coins in your hands, that is, you had constant access to matter. Now you need to absorb matter and, shall we say, accumulate it. As you usually do with electricity, but now do it with metal in coins. When you succeed, throw in the coins and try to keep the cover. To make it easier, first cover only the fingers, then the fist and finally the wrist. There is no point in covering further, because you no longer have enough matter. Understood? I asked. Yes. I'll do everything. What's next? Cover my whole body? Ashley asked excited. Not. It's too far for that yet. When you can keep the cover without recharge for at least five minutes, we will move on to other materials. For example, to a stone or a tree. You need to get used to the special properties of materials. And then how it goes. I said. Okay, then I will train. Ashley said and began to cover her fingers with metal. Now you, Gwen. Show me your magic disc again. I asked Gwen. Gwen listened to me, raised her hand and after a couple of seconds a pink magic disc with a diameter of 30 centimeters appeared on her hand. When the disc was ready, she threw it into the ground a couple of meters from us. The disc spoiled the ground a little and dispersed. So pink, yes. I muttered and thought a little. Why my mana is a different color? As far as I remember, both my grandmother, and Gwen, and my other cousin Sunny, who is also anodite, all magical constructions are pink. Of course Sunny's designs were completely opaque, while Gwen's were translucent. But I thought it was because Sunny is stronger and better developed her skills than Gwen. It looks like there is something else here. In general, the original never showed a male anodite. I am the first anodite man I have seen or read about. There was also nothing in the plumber's database about the anodite men. Maybe it's something like the color of the essence. Because, in the original, everything around Ben was green and around me was blue. So, is the color of the eyes. But this is also illogical, because Gwen has green eyes and pink mana. I'll have to ask Verdona about this when I can meet her. Or I will look later in books on magic. So far, it makes no sense to think about it. What do you think? Gwen asked, distracting me from my thoughts. Very good. Well done, you were able to create a disc without my help, and it is also so stable. But did you manage to learn how to drive mana through the body? I asked, although I guess that it is unlikely. Not. I wanted to create a construct much more. So I immediately went on to this, said the quiet Gwen, seeing my displeased look. This is you in vain. After all, this is necessary, not only in order to increase physical characteristics, this exercise increases control over magic and makes it easier to pass mana through the body, thereby increasing the strength of structures and the speed of their creation. Look. I said and created a blue disc in my right hand. It was slightly unstable and slightly transparent but he still looked better and more powerful than Gwen's. It was without mana filling. And now, with the filling. I said and threw the first disc into the ground. Then I launched mana over the body. Because of this, a small haze of blue color came from my entire body. Raising my hand, I created another disc. Unlike the first, this disc was created faster. And he was more than about 7 centimeters and was much more stable, and even stronger in appearance. Throwing it into the ground, the disc did three times more damage than the first one. This is what will happen. Calmly said and looked at the stunned Gwen. Now you understand how important it is? 
Yes. I'm sorry I didn't listen to you. I just wanted you to be proud of me. Gwen said, looking down. I'm proud of you, but just be careful. It may be dangerous. Better next time consult. I advised. Understood. Said the saddened Gwen and lowered her head. Okay. Let me teach you one more construction, and then you will begin to train the filling mana of the body. I said in an encouraging voice and stroked her hair. From this, Gwen directly blossomed. Watch attentively. It's basically a simple mana wall. But she can help you a lot. Especially if there is an explosion. You will be able to protect, not only yourself, but, for example, your grandfather. This is done quite simply, just like with a disc, but with two hands. I said and began to show. Raising both arms to chest level, I began to create a construct. After five seconds, a wall of mana appeared in front of me, two meters high and three meters long. She seemed stable, but a haze of magic was constantly coming out of her, indicating a loss of mana and an imperfect design. This is how it looks. It can also be used as a platform. I said and lowered the wall to the ground. Then he stood on her. But she immediately dissipated. As you can see, she's not perfect yet. But even a design of this level can protect well. Do you understand everything? I said to Gwen that all this time she was looking at me and listening attentively. Yes. I can't wait to get started. Said the agitated Gwen. You will start right after you learn the mana filling. Not earlier, do you understand me? I cooled Gwen's ardor. At my words, Gwen only nodded obediently. I started to tell you how it's done. After 20 minutes, I left Gwen alone and went to train in magic myself. You need to achieve perfection in the creation of the disc and the wall. After a few hours, I decided it was time to finish. During this time, I was finally able to create a perfect mana disc, it was now dense and completely opaque. I also learned how to change its size from 5 centimeters to a meter, and all these discs were stable and dense. I also brought the mana shield to perfection, although I could not change the size yet. But I learned how to make a ladder, like Gwen in the original. True, he could only take 4 steps, after which he immediately fell. This will take more time. Slightly improved control and reduced mana cost. Now I can increase physical characteristics by 25%. When I finished, I decided to check on Gwen. Apparently she has learned to filling mana all over her body, but not yet well enough. But still, thanks to this, its physical characteristics are improved by 10%. Not bad for a first try. She can create a mana shield, but it dissipates almost immediately. I did my best. Let's continue next time. Let's go after Ashley, I already want to eat. I said and walked towards Ashley. Gwen followed me. Ashley, how are you? I asked, going up to the girl. Things are good. I can cover my entire wrist, without recharge, for three minutes. Your advice helped me a lot, it was much easier that way. Now if I hold coins, I don't need to keep concentration, the cover keeps on itself for more than 10 minutes. Said, very pleased with her own progress, Ashley. Well done. Since everything is going so well, take this. I said and handed her a stone that I found on the way. You treat a stone as you do with coins. But that's for later, now you need to rest. I smiled and went to the RV. Approaching the mobile home, I saw my grandfather lying in the sun and dozing. Having managed to wake him up, we drove to the nearest roadside town. There are just a huge number of such towns in America. There we ate in a simple cafe and went to bed. I am very tired for today, and not only me. Chapter 25, 24 Roho and Robot Attack June 15, 2010 The next morning, we got up and had breakfast, after which we drove to the gas station to refuel and wash our mobile home. 
While grandfather was looking after his favorite bus, I went with Gwen and Ashley to buy sweets on the road. Ashley was a little uncomfortable with the fact that we were spending money on her, but I reassured her by saying that I have enough money due to the inheritance of my parents. Realizing that she shouldn't be shy, Ashley bought a bunch of sweets. Sometimes I forget that she is a simple girl. When we left the store, we saw grandfather who was washing a house on wheels. Just at that moment, a laser weapon was fired at the collector's car that stood across the road. The perpetrators were three women wearing biker jackets with helmets on their heads. It was Rojo's gang. They were using clearly extraterrestrial technology. Where such a petty ragtag like them got such advanced weapons is unclear. Wasted no time, I raised my hand and, using telekinesis, pulled the weapon out of their hands. Gwen also quickly reacted, and creating two discs threw them at Rogo's henchmen, from which they flew a couple of meters, but did not pass out. I decided to check my new alien. Therefore, making sure that no one sees, I turned into the Sandman. You know, this was the most unpleasant transformation into an alien, for all the time that I have the Omnitrix. It felt like my whole body was shattered into small pieces, and then I gathered into a loose and unstable substance. I did not like it. But after the transformation, when I became the Sandman, I felt so free and light. It felt like I was every grain of sand, but at the same time I was all the sand. I can't explain it better, but it was fun. Transformed, I instinctively controlled the sand and enveloped all three of the bandits, completely covering them with sand. After a minute, I returned all the sand back. The criminals fell out of the sand. They were unconscious. It was surprisingly easy. I already wanted to turn back, but from the bus there was a signal from the tracking device, which I changed, and now it warns of the arrival of the Vilgax robots. All the same, you cannot run far from the cannon. I had about a minute more, so while controlling the sand, I grabbed Roho and her minions and carried them away from the future battlefield. Finally, I wrapped them in sand up to their throats and tamped the sand itself so as not to kill them, but they will not get out of there without help. I don't want to get hands dirty on them, but I don't want to create an enemy for myself. So let them lie there. Transforming into myself, I ran into the bus and picked up the tracking device. Judging by the sensors, there will be about 40 robots. What the hell? Why are there so many? In the original, there were only two. The fact that they found us can still be understood, after all, it was here that they attacked Ben. These are consequences of the cannon. But 40? Okay, breathe calmly. We can handle it, it won't be that difficult, but we need to prepare. I thought to myself. Seeing my actions, the grandfather and the girls were clearly embarrassed and did not understand what I was doing. I got off the bus and said. Vilgax's robots are flying. There will be about 40 of them. Grandpa get your weapon, just in case. Ashley, I'm giving you permission to draw on the electricity. Your cover is still weak and you do not know how to fight hand to hand. But that's just this time. Grandpa ran for the weapon. Ashley walked over to the drinks machine and soaked up the electricity. Gwen began to chase Mana around the body. I put on my suit. Just at that moment, Vilgax drones began to appear from the sky. Underscore. Third POV. 30 minutes before. Space. Vilgax's ship. Sir, it looks like the Omnitrix bearer found a loophole and was able to disable tracking. But our scientists working on this problem were able to pick up a short-term signal and find the location of the carrier, but the signal immediately disappeared and we can no longer find it. Reported the soldier Vilgax. Send 40 drones there at once. The one who found the watch looks like an unusual person and has already been able to understand how the Omnitrix works. So it's better to play it safe. The drones must kill the host and bring the Omnitrix here. Ordered Vilgax, who was in a closed treatment chamber. He had very little time left until he was completely healed. As you order. Saluting, the soldier said and began sending stones to Earth. Underscore. 
likes POV. I immediately turned into a heat blast and threw a fireball at the first drone, from which it exploded. The next drone was shot down by Gwen with her magic disc. Ashley did not defend her and fired several electrical attacks in the third. When I shot down the fifth and sixth, Grandpa joined the attack with his gun. So, after five minutes, Ashley and Grandpa ran out of energy, and Gwen was exhausted. I finished off the last four robots. After destroying the last robots, I turned into myself and decided to check all the drones. You never know. Passing by broken robots, I noticed several more functioning and, using telekinesis, crushed them. Already returning to the bus, I noticed that one of the drones pulled out a tentacle and was about to attack Robo with it. At the last moment, I managed to catch the tentacle with telekinesis and finished off the robot. Roho has such a fate. Turn into a cybernetic creature. I have already heard the sirens of the police, which is, as always, on time. Therefore, without wasting time, using telekinesis, I pulled all the remnants of the robots and squeezed them into a ball. Then he became a heat blast and melted all the rubbish. Becoming myself, I went to the RV, tired grandfather and girls sat next to him. Taking off my suit, I said. Let's get on the bus and get out of here. Vilgax could send reinforcements, it is better to leave the city and fight there. The girls and grandfather nodded in agreement with my decision. We quickly got on the bus and drove out of town. 30 minutes after we left the city, the tracking device beep again. Taking it in hand, I saw that it would be four large bots. This time only four. You go on, I can handle it myself. I said, getting to my feet. Are you sure? You can handle it? Can we still help? Grandpa asked with concern. Everything will be fine. Do not worry. I said and turned into a ghost freak, after which I flew through the ceiling of the bus and went to the landing site of the robots. Underscore. Third POV. Vilgax's ship. Sir, all drones are destroyed. Reported the soldier. Send more. For big ones this time. And plug in the broadcast, I want to see everything in person. Vilgax ordered angrily. The soldier nodded and dispatched another batch of robots. Underscore. Lex POV. I arrived just as the robots arrived and began to release their form. I immediately transformed into Jet Ray and fired a laser from the eyes and tail into the head of one of the robots. From my attack, the robot's head was simply blown off and it blew up, thereby hitting the closest ally with an explosion and stunning him. The other two bots saw me and fired a laser from their hands. Seeing the attack, I, right in the air, turned into feedback and absorbed the shots with the help of my antennae. After landing on the ground, I fired from my fingers at one of the robots. This attack took off half of his body and he exploded too. The third robot, which did not suffer in any way, attacked me again, but I managed to turn into Diamond Head and take the attack on myself, after which I redirected the laser at its owner. The robot did not survive this. The last robot finally came to its senses, but I acted faster and turned into four arms with a clap of hands against each other created a shockwave that knocked the robot over. Jumping onto the robot, I crumpled its core, then hit it on the head with all four hands. This turned out to be enough. After getting off the robot, I cancelled the transformation. After examining the battlefield, I was convinced of the destruction of the robots and, transforming into XLR8, rushed to the bus. Underscore. Third POV. On the captain's bridge of Vilgax's ship, one could see an ordinary soldier and a closed capsule. On the main monitor, there was a video of Lex destroying robots. In the last moment, Lex can be seen, dressed in his suit, transforms into a kinney cellarant and escapes from the scene. Sir, send more robots? Soldier asked. No, it's pointless. He's too good. In a few days I will completely come to my senses and take care of it myself. Said Vilgax and looked at the monitor, which froze a frame with Lex in a suit. Underscore. 
Lex POV. Back on the bus, I calmed everyone down and told them about the fight. They, making sure that I was not hurt, heaved a sigh of relief. Still, it's nice to be worried about you. We spent the next few hours on the road. Everyone was tense, waiting for another attack. But nothing happened. When we got to the campsite, we had lunch and were finally able to breathe easy. Chapter 26, 25. Suits for girls. Today we decided not to do anything else because everyone was tired. Until the evening we just rested and went about our business. Ashley watched movies with me, Gwen read, and Grandpa Max again rummaged in the bus engine. In honor of the victory, Grandfather decided to arrange a surprise for us and, somewhere in the bins of the refrigerator, he found crocodile meat. Gwen and Ashley were skeptical about this surprise, but I knew how delicious it was if cooked right. And Grandfather knew how to make excellent crocodile kebabs. Fortunately, the place where we stayed had everything we needed. Therefore, I lit the grill, and my grandfather cooked the meat. In two hours everything was ready. I had to persuade the girls to try, but when they ate one piece at a time, they could not be torn from the meat. In my opinion, the two of them ate more than grandpa and I. After supper I decided to get down to business. Taking out my laptop and calling Morgana, I began designing protective suits for Gwen and Ashley. And something for Grandpa. The suit for Gwen will be able to pass magic. It will not be as strong as mine, but lighter. Still, a shot from a tank will withstand. True, only one. A protective mask will also be available, but you can remove it completely, or leave it partially. I decided to abandon the exoskeleton function, since Gwen is, first of all, a ranged fighter. As a last resort, she can saturate her body with mana in order to increase her physical characteristics. When I finished the design and calculated all the materials needed, I called Gwen for help. I'm not a fashion designer, and I'm not going to wear it, let the design decide for myself. Gwen decided on the color, design, and added a few more. As a result, the suit will be black with dark pink accents. When she uses magic, lines of hot pink will appear across the suit. Also, Gwen decided to diversify the costume and added a small hoodie with a hood, a scarf, and a skirt, also black with elements of pink. After that, it was the turn of Ashley's costume. It will consist of the same materials, but there will be some additions. When Ashley uses her abilities, the suit will take over them. That is, if Ashley uses a metal cover on herself, then the suit will also have such a cover. Double protection. Plus, the suit has the ability to change the shape of the gloves so that Ashley can turn her hands into weapons without removing the suit. Also, the suit will increase her physical characteristics by 20%. It is not much, but if used at the same time with the cover, it will be a good result. Then there was the design change, under Ashley's close vision, of course. It is now a dark red suit with silver accents. The mask has the same functions as the Gwen costume. Ashley didn't change or add anything else. She already liked everything. By this time it was already quite late, so we went to bed. We'll create the costumes tomorrow. Underscore. June 16, 2010. Waking up early in the morning, we had breakfast and went to look for a deserted place to train. Having found such a 20 kilometers from the campsite, we decided to stop here. Going out into the open, I looked at Ashley and asked about her results. According to Ashley, for five minutes she could calmly hold the cover on her hand made of stone and metal without recharge. With a source of material, it can already hold on for half an hour. It was undoubtedly fast. After listening to her, I decided to give the following assignment. Now, take coins in one hand and a stone in the other and try to absorb them at the same time. When it works, do it without a source. Then you will move on to other materials. After listening to me, Ashley nodded and went to train. After that, I looked at Gwen and said. Now you, Gwen. Try to increase your control over magic a little more today and get to perfection in creating a magic disc. 
but I can create a disc anyway. Said, not understanding anything, Gwen. Yes, but you need to learn how to do this. I said and created a disc of mana with a diameter of 30 centimeters. Then I began to randomly resize it from 5 centimeters to 1 meter. This is what it means to reach perfection. You see, my disc is always dense and opaque, no matter the size. You don't feel it, but there is no mana drain either. This is what you have to learn today. When you succeed, you can proceed to creating a mana shield. Understood? I asked. Yes. Gwen nodded and also went to train. I, after making sure that I had finished all the work, got on the bus, took my laptop and went to the cave. Arriving there a couple of seconds later, I connected my laptop to the main computer and sent the blueprints for the suits to it. When everything was ready, I took out all the materials and turned on the printer for the suits. This time, I already had all the materials, so I didn't have to do anything else. The printer will create the costumes by itself. For Gwen's costume, it was also necessary to create a hood and a skirt, which will be created from a very strong, but lightweight fabric and will be completely part of the costume. While the costumes were being created, I decided to do something for grandfather. Since he won't wear a suit, and the protection won't hurt him, I came up with something else. Using the same technology commonly used for spaceship energy shields, I created a belt. When Grandpa is attacked, an invisible shield will appear from his belt that completely covers his body. This shield can only be pierced by a volley of all the guns of Vilgax's ship. It is clear that a piece of Tatanite will act as a source of energy. This protective belt looks like an ordinary black leather belt, all the technological filling is hidden. I think Grandpa will like it. The costumes were still not ready, so I decided to waste the time. First, I turned into a slug and took his DNA, after which I repeated the same process with Krob, Tenten, Buzzshock, and Sandman. After putting all the materials in containers, and then in the refrigerator, I went to the training ground. I started the check, again with the slug. First, I tested its flexibility and ductility. After that there was a test of strength and speed. According to the results, the slug can run at a speed of 35 km h and is capable of lifting 4 tons. Very good for a slurry with handles. Then I checked the main ability of this alien. Metamorphism. At first he turned into himself. It was kind of weird, I kind of looked the same as usual, but I feel so thin. I did not find any differences in myself, it seems that no one will even understand that I am now an alien, since the Omnitrix symbol is hidden inside me. Then I began to take on the image of other people. Later he tested the transformation into aliens, and then into animals. I can even turn into a bug. Apparently, I can only adopt the appearance, but not the ability. Well, at least something. This is a good, and most importantly useful alien, but I am still worried that in his image I can literally dissolve from the water. In the future, it will be necessary to do something about it. Then he turned into Krob and tested his skills. Calmly fired from the claw with a laser and chemicals. Then I traveled underground. I saw everything in several spectra and even through walls. This is useful. It was 1010's turn. When I turned into him, I immediately felt as if I had been honing my shooting skills all my life. Instinctively, he took out a laser pistol that somehow appeared during the transformation and fired at the targets that were on the training ground. As a result, 10 out of 10. Not bad. Then I flew a little on a jetpack and fired some more. The next was Buzz Shock. In his image, I trained the ability to control and absorb electricity. There was enough energy even to create an electro clone. The clone, by the way, was completely under my control, but still could perform actions on its own. It is somewhat similar to the shadow clone from Naruto, although the memories do not return. The latter tested the ability to travel on power lines. It's very fun and cool, and most importantly, fast. I can get from my base to New York in just a second. A new way of traveling never hurts. 
And finally, the Sandman. Everything is simple here, complete control over the sand. Not only over your own, but over any other. Plus, I can turn any soil into sand. The only thing that upset me was that I can only handle the most common sand. Iron sand is out of my control. It's a pity. But this alien actually has tremendous potential. Controlling the sand, I turn from an anthropomorphic heap of sand into myself, only sandy. Basically, I'm now a sandlobia like Sir Crocodile from One Piece. At this point, I decided to finish checking, especially since the costumes were just ready. Unlike my suit, which is kept in my backpack, the girls' suits will be kept in the belt. They will not have access to Morgana, so they will need to press a button on the belt badge to don the suit. Although, of course, additional useful functions were built into their mask. Taking the suits and belt for grandfather, I rushed off to the family. Arriving at the place, I hid the costumes for now, then I will give them back when the occasion appears. I'll hand over the belt now. Approaching Max, who was now resting in the sun, I handed him the belt, while saying. Grandpa, take this. This is a present for you. What is it? He asked, looking curiously at the belt he took in hand. This is a safety belt. When you are in danger, an invisible shield will appear around you and protect you from attack. I said. Thanks, Lex. Said the grandfather and smiled, then put on the belt. I decided to immediately prove its usefulness and, moving away, turned into 1010 and, drawing out my weapon, shot at grandpa. Max was taken aback by this and did not even have time to be frightened, as a shield appeared around him and absorbed the attack. This is how it works. I said when I cancelled the transformation. Don't scare me, no more. Max grumbled displeased, clutching his heart. Smiling at him and laughing a little at his reaction, I went for the girls. I found Ashley 20 meters from the bus, now she was holding a piece of wood in her hand and was trying to absorb it. How are you? I said, going up to her. Things are good. I was able to learn to cover each hand with a different material within three minutes, but only if I was holding the material itself. But thanks to this, my control has improved, and now I can keep the cover on one hand, without a source of material, for eight minutes. Said a satisfied Ashley. Well done, Ashley. Go to the bus, we are leaving soon. After listening to me Ashley went to the bus, and I followed Gwen. She was almost 300 meters from the bus. When I found her, she was sitting on the ground and breathing heavily. How are you? I asked, sitting down next to her. Fine. I was able to slightly improve control and improve my magic disc, but not completely. But I learned to create and hold a mana shield. But I ran out of strength. Gwen said with a smile, trying to catch her breath. Excellent result. Come on, we're leaving. I praised her, stroking her back. When she had enough rest, we got up and walked to the camper. Sitting in the RV, grandfather started the engine and we drove to the next city. Chapter 27, 26. Zamboso and Circus Freak Trio. In the evening we reached the next city. Driving past the docks, we saw two thieves running with the loot, and the guards were chasing them. Without thinking twice, grandfather stopped and the girls got off the bus. I decided to leave everything to them, they will figure it out themselves. In general, it happened. Through the window, I saw Gwen create a disc and throw it at one of the bandits. The disc hit him right in the head and he fell as if knocked down. Ashley obviously wanted to absorb up the electricity, but then she remembered that she was not allowed to do this. So she took out of her pocket the stone that I gave her for training. Covering her hand with a stone cover, she threw the stone itself at the bandit. Hit right in the back. From the blow, the thief was arched and he flew about three meters, after which he lost consciousness. It hurt, probably a couple of bones were broken. Ashley has a good eye. Must not forget and teach her to fight at least a little. 
The girls returned just as the guards tied the failed thieves. I even feel a little sorry for them, but just a little. Then we went to the city center. And there, Gwen saw the Zumboso Circus sign. Oh, how I do not want to deal with him. With the original Ben, I have little in common, but we have a mutual dislike for clowns. I still have it from my past life. As a child, I once read Stephen King's It, and I must say I was too impressed. Now I hate clowns. This is not fear, just a strong dislike and disgust. I would love to leave Zamboso alone, but he will do some business, besides, my family may suffer. And I cannot allow this. While I was thinking, Gwen said. Look, circus. Can we go? I haven't been to the circus for a long time. This is a good idea. What do you think? Said the grandfather, referring to me and Ashley. I've never been to the circus. Mom really does not like the circus because of cruelty to animals, so she forbade me to go there. Said Ashley. I have some bad feeling about this circus. Let me first take a look at what they write on the internet about the Zamboso Circus. I said and took out my laptop. Ten minutes later, I finished searching and thoughtfully stretched out. Hmm. What did you find out? Asked Grandpa, knowing full well that my instinct is never wrong. I was right, with this circus, something is not clean. In all the cities where the circus came, there were a lot of robberies. Also, after the circus left the city, many people fell into a coma. There were also people who seemed to have lost all their joy and fell into depression. All these people were either visitors to the circus or were near it. But the victims come to their senses after about a couple of months and then everything was fine with them. I told the information that I had found in truth. Horrible. Anything else? Gwen asked, shocked. Yes. This Zamboso has been searched for all over the country for a year now. But he always disappears before anyone realizes who he is. It has also been written about his accomplices. Three mutants. One is called Thumbskull, he has superpower and for some reason a nail grows out of his head. The second is called Acid Breath, he can spit acid. And the last one, Frightwig. She has light hair, she can control it. I added, already on my own, using my meta-knowledge. We need to catch them. Ashley said, with a warlike spirit. I think so too, but first we need to find out what's going on with people. Grandpa said seriously. And for this we need to go on reconnaissance. This is useful to you. I said and took out the belts with the girls' costumes. At first, the girls did not understand anything, but I said that first need to put on the belts. I gave the black belt to Gwen and the red belt to Ashley. Then they looked at me and waited for further instructions. Press the button on the plaque. I said. After listening to me, they pressed on the belt and they were wearing suits their own designs. Wow. This is so cool said Happy Ashley. It's so light and comfortable. Gwen said with admiration. Then thank me, but for now, take off your costumes. According to the schedule, there will be a performance in five minutes. We will penetrate there and find out what is happening there. Good. I told my plan. Everyone nodded and grandfather took us to the circus, to which we arrived a few minutes later. First, we decided to enter as regular visitors and see what happens. After Grandpa bought tickets for all of us, I said quietly. Be as careful possible, we do not know what awaits us. Don't get carried away by the show itself, don't even laugh. When we got to the tent, Grandfather said. Better not to go inside, let's see from here. We stayed at the entrance, trying to be as inconspicuous as possible and they began to wait for the start of the show. A couple of minutes later, an entertainer, illuminated by a searchlight, entered the stage and began to greet the audience, after which he called Zamboso himself onto the stage. How creepy he is. BRRR. Zamboso looks like a clown with red hair and pale skin. 
He wore a gray and white suit with three buttons, a navy blue blazer, and blue sleeves with black stripes and two blue circles on each stripe. He also had a blue nose, a navy black hat with a large blue ball, and black shoes and gloves. Zomboso started putting on a little show to cheer people up. Grandfather and I didn't laugh because we were totally focused, but Ashley and Gwen were laughing. Turn away. Better not to look, since you cannot control yourself. I said displeasedly and turned them back to the tent. Still, I know how dangerous it is and I can't help but worry. Sorry. He's just very funny. Trying to contain her laughter, said Gwen. Yes, it's very hard not to laugh. Supported her friend Ashley. In a minute they were already in order, but still they did not look, but only listened. At that moment, Zomboso summoned his machine, which steals laughter and energizes it. Lex, look these are the mutants you mentioned. Gwen drew my attention and pointed her finger at the freaks who were leaving the circus. Most likely they are going to rob while Zomboso distracts attention. Go follow them. If you have something to fight, but use suits, they will help you. Ashley, if you attack, then use the cover on both hands and fight like that. I commanded. The girls nodded and went after the mutants. When they left, far enough away, I said. Grandpa, follow them and cover them if anything. Are you sure you can handle it yourself? Asked Grandpa, but rather for show. He understands that Zomboso is only a human being, albeit a mutant. Compared to the robots of Vilgax, Zomboso is nothing. Yes. He's only one, and the girls may need help. I said with a nod. Good. But be careful. Max said and went after the girls. I continued to watch the show. Underscore. Gwen POV. As Lex said, the freaks really went to rob, and so did the neighboring jewelry store. As we hid behind the car, Ashley and I donned suits. At that moment, the big man threw a trash can into the window and smashed it. So what's the plan? Ashley asked me. You are wearing finger head. You will sneak up from behind and hit him with your strength on the head with your covered hands. I'll cover you. Having figured out what to do, I told. Good. Ashley said and absorbed the metal from the car, which is why her gloves, to the elbows, became black with red lines. Walking around the car, Ashley quietly went to the big man. He just stood with his back to us, like the rest of the mutants. Once next to him, Ashley put her hands together, jumped up and hit the freak on the head with all her might. From this he collapsed, but did not lose consciousness but for two minutes he definitely won't get up. What? Said Acid Breath and turned to us. Just when he was supposed to look at Ashley, my disc flew into his head. From the blow, he flew straight into local Gorgon and immediately passed out. What the? Said the Frightwig as the Acid Guy flew into her. Get off me. Said the long-haired woman, trying to take off the carcass of Acid Breath. When she did it, she was about to stand up when a black fist flew into her face. It was Ashley, who just came up to the freak girl and hit her. True, one blow was not enough. But Ashley, wasting no time, hit the Frightwig in the face three more times, from which she was already completely blacked out. At that moment, I approached Thumbskull, who was still trying to recover, and launched several of my magic discs in his face. He passed out only after the tenth. It was easy. Ashley exclaimed and gave me five. Easy peasy. I said with a smile. Underscore. Max POV. Now, I watched the girls deal with mutants. And I must say that they did a good job. They did not ask for trouble, made a plan and carried it out. But still, they still lack attentiveness. I thought when I saw how Acid Guy came to his senses and got to his feet. And the girls did not notice this, because they were talking and celebrating their victory. Well, that's what I'm here for. I thought, and shot Freak with Lex's shocker. Good thing, I took it for a reason. 
From the electric shock, acid breath twitched for a couple of seconds, and this time he definitely passed out. Grandfather? Asked the shocked Gwen, noticing how I came out of hiding and knocked acid breath out. Lex told you to be as careful as possible. You celebrated victory too early and did not notice how the enemy came to his senses. I scolded them. Sorry, Grandpa Max, Gwen apologized and lowered her head. Sorry, Mr. Tennyson. Also dropping her head, said Ashley. Next time, be careful and constantly monitor your surroundings. I said, in an instructive tone. Good slash okay. Said the girls at the same time. But you, all the same, well done. I said with a smile. At my words, the girls smiled, pleased with themselves. And Ashley, you can call me grandpa too. I'm not against. I said softly. But, Ashley tried to argue, but I interrupted her and said. I insist. Okay, Grandpa Max Ashley said dutifully. However, she was clearly glad. Well, that's good, and now let's go to Lex. He's probably finished by now. Underscore. Lex POV. When everyone else went after the freaks, I waited a few minutes for people to get a little weak and not notice me. Then, I did the same as Ben did in canon. I was just too lazy to come up with something new. Turning into the ghost freak, I just beat up some boso and destroyed his device. He was chatting something, but I was not listening. By the way, what's really weird is when I scared Zumboso, he really exploded and disappeared. In general, I wanted to kill him, but I could not deny myself the pleasure of scaring him. And he took the boom and that's it. I didn't think it would really be that way. Here is a coward. Well, nothing, he will still appear and I will finish him off. I confess, I had the idea to pick up Zumboso's machine, after all, this is a rather interesting opportunity, it becomes stronger, fueled by the laughter of people, but after thinking a little, I realized that I didn't need it, so I didn't hold back. When the laughter sucking machine exploded, people started to wake up, so I dumped. By the way, Zayscare is still swarming in the backyard of his consciousness, but he is not trying to seize control. Apparently waiting for his comrades. After flying out of the circus, I found my family and, becoming myself, approached them while asking the question. How are mutants? The police have already taken them. Said grandfather with a smile. How about Zamboso? Gwen asked. I beat him up and destroyed his machine. Seemingly using it, he was stealing laughter from people and feeding on it to become stronger. When the device exploded, people began to come to their senses. And for some reason Zamboso himself exploded and disappeared. Most likely he ran away. I said with a shrug. Well, nothing, the main thing is that people are okay. Let's go to the RV, it's late and it's bedtime. Said the grandfather with an encouraging smile. Nodding, we all walked to the mobile home, where, immediately, everyone fell asleep. Today has been a long day. Chapter 28, 27. Serum. June 17 to 19, 2010. The next three days were routine. There were no robot attacks or new enemies appearing. A couple of times, of course, we met robbers, but I did not interfere, the girls themselves dealt with them. This is not a bad workout for them. Most of these days we stayed in a desert area and the girls practiced. I remembered one important detail. I never scanned Ashley to add Osmosian DNA to the Omnitrix. When I remembered this, I immediately went to Ashley and tried to scan her, but nothing happened. It looks like this was a special case as the Omnitrix spoke again. According to AI Omnitrix, there is not enough alien DNA in Ashley to add an alien. At first I didn't understand anything, so I decided to check everything myself. Taking some blood from Ashley, I took out my portable laboratory and tested the blood. After DNA analysis, I learned that apparently Ashley had not yet fully awakened her osmosis nature, so the Omnitrix was unable to scan her DNA. He lacks all the data. 
Just in case, I checked Gwen's blood. And found out that Anodite's nature in Gwen is also still too weak. Trying to scan it with Omnitrin is also pointless. In fact, I didn't want to do that. I always wanted to awaken my Anodite power myself, without the help of the Omnitrix. Although, when I can shed my skin and become a full-fledged Anodite, the Omnitrix will scan my new DNA and allow me to return to the human form and back without any problems. This is actually good, I don't want to be always an energetic entity without a body. In my blood was the same as that of Gwen, I still have a long way to fully awaken the powers of Anodite. In general, in order to get the Osmosian form, I will have to wait. While the girls were practicing, I decided to start my next project. Due to the fact that all my aliens develop with me, and at the moment the only development available to me is natural growth, I decided to speed up this process. My solution is very simple, to create a super soldier serum, based on the blood of some of my aliens. I do not need to be afraid of side effects, because of my special physique, all the nasty things will be destroyed by my body. So this is the perfect way. I again took blood samples from some of the aliens to test it and try to find a way to create the serum. I mainly used DNA from Tetramand, XLR8 and RAF. Since I need to increase my strength, speed and stamina, these are the most suitable aliens to create serum. With Morgana's help, I took apart the DNA of these aliens into its component parts to remove all unnecessary and leave only what is useful to me. Without my wonderful artificial intelligence, I would have been doing this for several weeks, but thanks to Morgan, it took only three hours for each alien. Then, I tried to connect together everything that I needed. Unfortunately, nothing worked. I made several attempts, but it was no use. Morgana suggested that I check the DNA of other aliens to check compatibility. And so I did. Thanks to the wild mud DNA, I was able to stabilize the serum a little, but something else was missing. The solution was found in the Unicall body of the upgrade. Its DNA won't give me any powers, but it can pull all the serum together and stabilize it, even slightly increasing its effectiveness. As a result, Tetraman DNA will increase my physical strength, stamina and endurance, XLRA DNA will increase my speed, agility and reaction, and Wrath DNA will increase my regeneration rate, improve my senses and give me feline flexibility. Last but not least, Wild Mud DNA will give me a kind of spider sense. According to Morgana's analysis, there are several shortcomings in this serum, but this does not bother me much, since my body will fix everything on its own. In order to give a serum to someone else, it needs to be improved, but for now, I don't know exactly what it is missing. Fortunately, this is not important at the moment. In the end, having finished all the examination, I asked Max for leave and went to my cave. Arriving at the laboratory, with the help of alien equipment and alien blood, I was able to synthesize my serum. I didn't think too much about the name and called it Omni Amplifier. The serum itself looked like a black goo with specks of different colors. Taking a flask of serum, I went to the medical unit. Yes, there is one. First, I took a powerful sleeping pill. I don't want to feel pain. Let all the changes take place while I sleep. Then, I injected the serum and lay down on the couch. After a couple of minutes, I began to feel a faint burning sensation all over my body, but before it got stronger, I was already asleep. I woke up, judging by the clock, after six hours. I felt just fine. Getting up from the couch, I went to the mirror and looked at the external changes. There were no external mutations, but all my muscles were more clearly visible. Plus, I added about five centimeters in height. I also checked my weight and found that I had gained 10 kilograms of extra muscle and muscle. But I did not become pumped, my figure of a swimmer was preserved. First of all, I checked my blood for changes and mutations. When the tests came, I was very surprised. There were no changes at all. It looks like my body has completely assimilated all the serum and absorbed it. This is actually great. In the future, there will be no problems. Having finished with the analysis, I went to the training ground to personally check all the changes. 
But on the way, I broke several doors. It is imperative to learn how to control your newfound powers. The whole check took me several hours and I can say that I am completely satisfied with the result. Now, I can lift objects weighing at 2 tons, run continuously for an hour, at a speed of 60 kilometers, only then I get tired. Small bore weapons leave only bruises that disappear in a minute. A 5 centimeters cut heals in 2 minutes. And spider sense is just something. Although this is more of a dog sense, but it sounds terrible, so let's have a spider. In general, to make it clearer, this is a developed sixth sense, warning in advance of danger. It took me another three hours to get used to the new strength. For some reason, my magic got stronger too. Now my magic discs are stronger and stronger. The mana shield is generally capable of withstanding a missile shot. Telekinesis has gotten a little bit stronger and easier to use, but that's about it. And telepathy just began to put less pressure on the brain, but at least something. Then, I checked all of my aliens and saw that their powers increased. But again, outwardly there were no changes at all. All my heroes have become twice as strong, but only physically. And any other abilities, like pyrokinesis of the heat blast, remained the same. But such aliens as Forearms and Diamond Head have just got a huge improvement. This, in principle, was what I was counting on. I have other plans for further strengthening. After practicing for a few more hours, I returned to my family. I got on the bus and passed out for 12 hours. When I woke up, we were still there and the girls continued to train. By the way, they are great fellows. I am very proud of them. During those three days, Ashley learned how to absorb wood, rubber, and the Tatanite crystal, which I gave her. She can hold the cover on both hands, with all these materials, for more than five minutes without a power source. Today she tried to make a full cover of RV metal for the first time, but quickly fizzled out. Half a minute stood motionless with a cover holding on to the bus, and that's it. She couldn't do more. But this is still a very good result. In just a week of training, she achieved a lot. Gwen, on the other hand, improved control over her magic and was able to learn how to make a strong mana shield. He's still transparent though, which suggests his weakness and I've seen large mana leaks. But now, she can make a ladder from such shields, but only three steps. Well, that's okay, our next destination is New Orleans, and there we will meet Hex and we can get a book on magic. This is when the real learning of magic begins. After resting, I finally found time to teach Ashley how to fight hand-to-hand. -hand. Nothing serious, just staged a blow and taught me the correct postures. We did this until the evening. And then, we went to the nearest city, where we spent the night and in the morning went to New Orleans. Chapter 29, 28 Charms of Bezel and Arkhamata Book of Spells June 20, 2010. We finally made it to New Orleans. On the way, we again met the robbers who were leaving the police in a stolen car. Gwen stopped them by throwing a magic disc into the front wheel. From the impact of the disc, the tire burst, and the driver lost control and crashed into a pole. Then they were immediately tied up by the police. I don't understand what kind of fate we have so strange. We constantly meet all sorts of robbers. Already tired. Look, even Gwen is tired of them. When we entered the city, we saw the sign of the Witchcraft Museum. Shall we go on an excursion? Gwen asked. Let's go. Maybe we can find something related to real magic. I said, knowing full well that it would be so. Since Grandpa and Ashley had nothing against it, we all went on a tour of the museum together. The museum itself was full of strange exhibits, but we did not see anything truly magical. Until the tour guide, an old woman, perhaps even too old, brought us to the stand with an ancient book. You feel? Gwen asked me quietly. Yes. This book is clearly magical. I wonder what she is doing in such a place, and not in the collection of some powerful magician. 
Let's hear what the old lady has to say about the book itself. I suggested and began to listen to the guide. So, pay attention to the unique exhibit that is located behind this impenetrable glass. Here is the only copy of the Arkamata Book of Spells in the world. It describes the rituals and recipes for black magic of the late 17th century. Said the granny and led the visitors on. This book would be useful to us. Gwen said thoughtfully. We can make a copy. In general, it is better to pick it up. There is nothing such a dangerous thing in the museum for everyone to see. I suggested. Do you want to steal it? Gwen asked, with an intonation that said she didn't mind at all. Why steal it right away? You can take it for a while and check it for hazardous content. With a sly grin, I said. At the same time, learn a couple of spells. With an even more sly grin than mine, said Gwen. Then after closing, I'll borrow it for a while, I said. After my words, Gwen began to smile even more. We already wanted to follow other visitors, when suddenly the walls of the museum began to shake and all the people in the hall, including us, began to rise into the air to the ceiling. While everyone was distracted, I immediately put on a suit. A couple of seconds later, red smoke poured out of one window and a man in a mantle materialized in front of the counter with a magic book. It was Hex. Quite a strong wizard. He was dressed in a black robe with red lines on the sides and a hood. He had a skull painted on his face and five amulets on his chest. In hand Hex held a strange staff with a bird's skull instead of a pommel. When Hex appeared, he flew in front of the counter and started his villainous monologue. Like about the fact that having received the book he will receive unlimited power and become the ruler of the world, and so on and so forth. Generally, as always. While Hex was looking at the bulletproof glass and was about to use a spell to break it, I wasted no time in deciding to act. First, I started chasing mana all over my body to get rid of the effect of the Hex spell. Starting to fall, I turned into Jet Ray and flew towards Hex. The wizard himself had already managed to break the glass at that moment and was about to pick up the book when three laser beams hit him in the back. From the attack, Hex's body pierced through the wall and he fell into another hall. Having flown for the body of Hex, I turned into four arms and, until the wizard regained consciousness, hit him on the head. Oddly enough, Hex did not pass out, but was already on the verge. So I added one more hit. After completely knocking out Hex, I turned into XLR8 and returned to the next room. True, I could not slow down in time, due to the increased speed, and crashed into one of the walls. Due to the fact that Hex lost consciousness, his spell ended, and people began to fall. To catch people, I used a tapestry and tied it up so that people could come down safely. Without departing from the classics, as they say. Convinced of the safety of the people, I returned to Hex. On the way, picking up the Arkamata Book of Spells. When I returned, Hex was already beginning to come to his senses. So I hit him on the head again. I think I broke his jaw. But he definitely earned the concussion. Looks like I exercised too little after injecting the serum. I hit it too hard, then too weakly. I also crash into the walls. This misunderstanding must be corrected. When Hex passed out again, I decided to search him. First, I took all charms of bezels. Then he searched the robes and found a small magic book. Quickly checking it, I saw that there was only the basics of spell learning and a couple of simple spells. This will be very useful for Gwen and me because we can't use spells from the Arkamata book at a swoop. We need at least a little knowledge of magic and not just the techniques of the Anodites. But I don't understand why Hex needs this book because he is a master of magic. Maybe a souvenir, who knows? He had nothing else. At first I wanted to take his robes, but I thought that this was already quite cruel. Becoming myself, I checked the staff. The original said that only the master could use it, but Gwen could, most likely due to Anodite's legacy. Deciding to check, I gave Mana a staff and fired a bunch of magic at the wall. 
Working. But I do not need it, I have never liked all sorts of staves and sticks. I won't take it, but it's a pity to destroy it. And when, too, is unlikely to be needed. We still have a different type of magic. But if I just leave him, then Hex will run away. While I was thinking, holding the staff in my hand, I felt a strange union with the staff. It feels like he was giving me his magic. After thinking what I needed, I began to absorb mana from the staff, which was just a huge amount. When there was nothing left in it, the staff seemed to wrinkle a little, but did not break. Still holding it in my hands, I felt like mana from the environment into the staff, but at a terribly slow speed. To restore the old reserve, the staff will take decades, perhaps even centuries. But he will not be able to work in the next two or three weeks, so for now he is useless. And I myself, became magically, not that stronger, but rather purer. It feels like all my mana has been refreshed. I don't understand why this happened, but I liked it. With this, I decided to return. Turning back to XLR8, I left the Staff of Ages and taking the charms and two books of spells, I rushed to the RV. Before leaving, I noticed how the guards entered the hall where Hex lies. Arriving at the mobile home, I became myself and went inside. Max and the girls were already sitting there, and when they saw me, they noticeably relaxed. What happened there? Asked Grandpa. Nothing like that. This wizard, I think his name is Hex, decided to steal the Arcamata Book of Spells. Well, I beat him up and took all his artifacts and books on magic. I said casually, sitting down on the sofa. Did you rob him? Not too much, asked Grandpa Max. Yes. I did to him as he wanted to do. Better to have these artifacts with us. It's safer this way. Plus, when and I need to learn magic, and here is everything for that. All the same casually I said, knowing full well that Max is not so unhappy. Okay. I understand. But don't do that again for no reason. Said Grandfather, realizing that I understand that this is not a very decent act. Still, sometimes it is too correct. Of course, I know the boundaries. I said with a smile, calming him. So, what have you got there? Gwen asked curiously. Let's get out of here first and find a secluded spot. I'll tell you everything there. I said. Then I took out my laptop and began to search for information about charms of bezels. Since Gwen was able to do it in the original, then I can. In 20 minutes we were already on the outskirts of the city. When Grandpa stopped the RV, Everyone looked at me with visible curiosity. So. First, this little grimoire. I said and showed everyone a small red book. This is a book of elementary magic. There are instructions on how to start learning spells here. How to read spells and the like correctly. There are also a couple of the simplest spells. This will be very useful to Gwen and me. I said and put the book in front of me. Gwen looked at this book with longing eyes. I felt really creepy. Secondly, these charms. I said and took out five amulets, and then turned the laptop screen to them. They're called Charms of Bezel. They were once created by the great wizard Bezel, he is also called the father of magic. There should be six of them in total. But we only have five so far. The first charm is the charm of telekinesis. Gives its owner the ability to levitate and telekinesis. The second charm is the charm of pyrokinesis, which allows you to summon and control fire. The owner can not only set fires, explosions, increase the temperature, but also create fiery figures, build fire shields and inhale the fire directed at himself by the enemy. The third amulet is the charm of electrokinesis, which allows you to summon and control lightning. Like the charm of pyrokinesis, it allows you to work with different types of lightning, use them as a weapon and protection, absorb and reflect enemy attacks. Also gives control over electricity. The fourth amulet is the charm of resurrection, which brings back to life and heals the wounds of the owner. True, it is not known whether he can really resurrect a person, 
but he certainly gives a powerful regeneration. And the fifth amulet is the charm of luck and probability. Giving its owner incredible, even supernatural luck, forcing the whole world around to adjust to the best result for the owner. The most dangerous of the amulets, since it takes good luck for the owner from the environment, which can cause harm to innocent people or people close to the owner. I said. Also, as far as I understand, the charms themselves can be used by anyone who knows how to control energy. So even Ashley can use them. After my words Ashley shone straight. But the Arcamata Book of Spells is, in fact, an instruction for better use of the amulets themselves. So far, you are Gwen, and you Ashley can use the charms of telekinesis, pyrokinesis and electrokinesis, they are not interesting to me. I can use telekinesis anyway, and I have aliens for pyrokinesis and electrokinesis. I said and handed the girls three charms. They took them, but decided that then they would decide who got what when they practiced a little with them. I will study the book of Arcamata and learn better about the charms of luck and resurrection, suddenly they are some kind of dangerous. You have to be sure. I said, and Grandpa nodded at my words, pleased with my decision. Gwen, you can take the book of elementary magic for now. I added, and after scanning the book with my bracelet with Morgana, I gave it to Gwen. Morgana scanned the entire contents of the book and stored everything in her database. I did the same with the book of Arcamata. It will come in handy. After the conversation, Grandpa started the engine and we drove to another part of the city. Away from the museum, just in case. And Gwen and I began to study our new books on magic. Chapter 30, 29. Tattoo of Luck. Until the evening, I was busy reading the Arcamata book. The book itself was written in Latin. It's good that I also learned Latin, I knew that it would come in handy. In the book itself, there were mainly descriptions of the charms themselves and their secrets. About the charms of telekinesis, pyrokinesis and electrokinesis, nothing significant was written there. Their description is completely true. That is, telekinesis, pyrokinesis and electrokinesis, respectively. Also, there were several offensive spells for each charms. For example, there is a spell for the charm of telekinesis Awakatello Falagito. It allows to animate and manipulate plants using telekinesis. It works without the amulet, but much weaker. Quite a powerful spell, it can be very useful in some situations. Or, for example, Bread of Allegoria. This spell causes nearby objects, such as debris, to levitate and attack or pursue the target. There is also Viterla Morbulus, which gives limited control over the ground and allows create cracks in the ground. For the charms of Pyrokinesis there is a spell Birdie Mordonata, which allows to create a fire attack, more like a plasma beam. By the way, it doesn't work without the amulet. There is also Kudz Attack, it allows to create a huge tsunami from fire. The charm of electrokinesis has a spell Rava Ilartas Galametroi, capable of creating a storm with lightning, completely controlled by the wizard. Lada Avita Mona Lada gives limited control over metal, thanks to electromagnetic waves. For the charms of luck and resurrection, there are no offensive spells, only control methods. For example, the charm of resurrection can indeed resurrect a person, but this is a one-time way. A person can be returned from the afterlife only if two conditions are met. Firstly, no more than two hours should elapse after death. Secondly, the corpse must be more or less intact. If a limb is missing, nothing else. But if there is no head, then nothing will work. To resurrect a person, need to put the charm in the hand of the corpse and crush the charm itself. In a few minutes, the person should fully recover and revive. Also, there were written ways to use the treatment. How to speed up healing or how to leave passive regeneration. And of course there are instructions on how to heal other people with the charm. For the charm of luck, there are instructions on how to tie the amulet to yourself so that it cannot be stolen and used by other people. And also, methods of control over the charm itself are described. To bind the charm, need to perform a small ritual. 
Soak the charm with own magic for two hours, then sprinkle it with blood and cast a long spell. There is also a way to manage the luck absorb. For example, can use it in one go. Plus, the book tells how to manage where luck comes from. Can simply absorb it from the environment, or can take a little bit and fill the reserve gradually. The best option is to take luck only from people with negative karma, for example, from criminals. The radius is quite large, almost 50 kilometers. There were also spells in the book that had nothing to do with the amulets themselves. For example, a time travel spell that was used several times by Gwen of the future. There are also spells associated with the keystone of bezel. The stone itself allows to increase the user's natural powers, strength, abilities, skills, tenfold. It also enhances the capabilities of the charms themselves. To find this keystone, need to use the spell Dark Aradoriki Agosto. If charms of bezel were destroyed, there is a spell to recreate them, Barbon Hex to Desertum, but it will only work in the presence of a solar eclipse. In my opinion, the most useful spell is Bodig Zabarito Carpes Nebagir Guys Lifen Intruders Yushin, an exorcism that works on the Ectonurites. It will be useful to me very soon, otherwise Zayscare got me very much, I want to get rid of it already. Of course there were other spells, but for now, I'll leave them alone. I have not yet studied the book of elementary magic, so now I have no time for them. Having finished studying the book, I decided to perform a ritual to tie the charm of luck. I have always believed that luck is the most useful force of all. Most of the characters in books, manga, films and cartoons would not have succeeded if they were not lucky in time. By this time, Max and Ashley were already asleep. And Gwen was still reading the second book on magic. Where are you going? Gwen asked when she saw me getting off the bus. I want to do something. I'll be back in a couple of hours. Do not worry. I said with a smile and got off the bus. After walking a couple of kilometers, I stopped and sat down on a tree stump, after which I began to saturate the charm with my mana. Exactly two hours later, I felt that the charm was ready. Therefore, with the help of a knife, which I took specially for this, I cut my hand and sprinkled blood on the charm. The charm itself absorbed all the blood. I had to cut my arm several times, as the regeneration worked faster than the charm was full. After 15 minutes, the once gray charm became completely bloody. And the stripes on it, which used to burn yellow, now glow blue, the color of my magic. It was written in the book that it was at this moment that need to cast a spell, which I did. The spell was painfully complex and long. I had to read it for five whole minutes in a row. When I finished chanting the spell, the charm glowed with a bright blue color, after which it disintegrated into small pieces and absorbed into my left hand. Taking off the bracelet with Morgana, I saw on my wrist a black tattoo in the form of a symbol that was on the charm of luck itself. When I tried to get up from the stump, I caught the root and at that moment the tattoo shone blue. I was still able to get to my feet, but a hefty bump fell from the tree onto the stump on which I was sitting. Lucky. So the amulet, although it's more like a tattoo, is working. First, I decided to completely customize the action of the tattoo of luck. Now, luck is absorbed only by criminals and other trash. Also, I made it so that luck was constantly absorbed, but little by little, so that it was not noticeable to the outside world. Plus, I created a large reserve inside for storing extra luck. This will always come in handy. The tattoo itself will work passively, but not too hard. I don't want to constantly find a gold watch on the road. It's cool, of course, but too tiring. I don't want to be like one light novel character I read about in a past life. He was the luckiest man in the world, but everyone around him was unlucky. This I avoided thanks to the tattoo settings. But in that story there was a moment when a meteorite fell on this character, and there was just a mountain of gold in him, that is, he seemed to be lucky. He could easily survive it, but his environment is unlikely. I don't need that kind of luck. The tattoo will only work fully when I need it. For example, if I want to play the lottery. Or during a fight. 
For example, if I fight with the same Vilgax, I will pump out his luck and use it for myself. In this case, he may well just stumble. I did not set the level of luck too high. It won't be fun if my opponent slips and knocks himself out. No, it's certainly very funny and cool, but absolutely boring. I will be lucky only when I want it or when I really need it. But I can always increase my luck if I need it. Putting the Morgana bracelet back on my wrist to hide the tattoo of luck, I decided to have some fun and test the work of my purchase. Transformed into an XLR8, I ran to Las Vegas. Before entering the biggest casino, I turned into a slug and assumed the guise of a random guy. By this, besides the obvious, I also wanted to check if my tattoo in the form of aliens works. Entering the casino, I immediately went to the slot machines. Sitting down at the first machine I came across, I put a token inside, pressed the button and immediately won $30,000. Everything seems to work despite the transformation. Then, I decided to try my luck to the maximum. Walking over to the machine, where the jackpot was almost $7 million, I started the machine again. And he won again. This time, he really hit the full jackpot. Deciding to end there, since the casino staff had already begun to look at me badly, I took all my winnings and left. Moving away from the casino, I noticed surveillance. Oh, how bad it is. Looks like the casino is playing dirty. Entering the alley, I turned into a ghost freak and became invisible. Ten seconds later, two guys in suits entered the alley. They held guns in their hands. While they were looking for the suddenly disappeared me, I flew up in one of them and appeared in front of him. Boo! I shouted, right in his face. A-A-A-A! Ghost shouted the criminal and lost consciousness with foam at his mouth. How timid he is, it's not even interesting. The second guy SAS me and started shooting with shouts. All the bullets went through me without causing absolutely no harm. I decided to try the tattoo of luck, so turning my luck onto the maximum, I flew to it. The second criminal, seeing the approaching ghost freak, began to move back. Suddenly, he kicked into a crack in the asphalt and began to fall. Falling, he hit his head and lost consciousness. Ha! That was really funny. Transformed into an XLR8, I ran to New Orleans, to our RV. Becoming myself, I went inside and saw Gwen, angrily looking at me. She also put her hands on her hips. Looks very cute. Where have you been? With a menacing note in her voice, asked Gwen. I decided to have some fun. I'll tell you everything tomorrow. Let's go to bed. It's already late. I said in a whisper. Do you know how worried I was? You left your phone. You said that you would be gone for two hours, but almost four had already passed. I already thought that something serious had happened to you. Gwen said in a whisper too, but with anger in her voice. What can happen to me? Do not be angry. Go here. I said in a soothing tone and hugged her around the waist, kissed her lips. Gwen happily answered the kiss, but with resentment in her voice, she said. I missed your kisses. Since Ashley's with us, you haven't given me any time at all. I'm sorry. It's just that so many things have piled up lately. Do you want to take a walk around the city tomorrow? Just you and me. I suggested. Yes, I want. Gwen answered instantly. Okay, then this will be our date. Now let's go to bed. I said and kissed Gwen again. We stood there for another five minutes, constantly kissing. Then, after parting, they went to their beds and soon fell asleep. Chapter 31, 30 Book of Elementary Magic Ashley POV I woke up in the middle of the night because I heard someone talking. Opening my eyes, I saw Lex and Gwen talking. Gwen seems to be angry with Lex because he has been out for a long time, and Lex is trying to calm her down. But then, I saw something that blew my brain. Lex kissed Gwen, and she returned the kiss. But how is it, they are cousins? 
Why have I never noticed that they have such a relationship? Of course, I saw Gwen look at Lex sometimes, and it was definitely not a sister's glances. But I didn't think it was serious. And here they are kissing so sweetly. It's almost five minutes now. Their air is endless, or what? Something in my heart aches. And an unpleasant feeling on the body. Is it jealousy? Lex and Gwen finally stopped kissing and went to their beds. I also wanted to fall asleep, but it didn't work. I remember their kiss all the time. He was so hot. I wanted to. So I suffered until the morning. As a result, I could not get enough sleep. Lex POV. June 21, 2010. I woke up only at 10 o'clock in the morning. Oddly enough, I returned at almost 5 a.m. In general, I like to sleep, and now I have only slept for 5 hours, and I am already asleep and vigorous. Probably a side effect of the serum. Damn it. It is of course convenient that I need to sleep less, but I would still prefer a long and, most importantly, sound sleep. Well, there's nothing can do about it. Gwen and Ashley were still asleep. Gwen understands why, after all, she read a book on magic until late at night, but Ashley is incomprehensible. Maybe she slept badly. Coming out of the bus, I saw grandfather digging in the engine again. Interestingly, he is not tired of doing this? Good morning, grandpa. I greeted him, stretching. Morning, did you find out about the charms? Max asked, wiping the oil off his hands. Yes. These charms are not entirely magical. It's just a very high-tech artifact, perhaps even more advanced than the Omnitrix. Therefore, they can be used not only by magicians, but also by people like Ashley. But only in the hands of magicians, they show all their power. I said and sat down on a chair that was standing next to me. What about the charms of luck and resurrection? Are they safe to use? Asked the grandfather, sitting down next to me. The Book of Arcamata had a detailed description of them and how to use them correctly. The charm of resurrection can indeed resurrect a person, but only once. And so, this is just an advanced first aid kit, do not worry. As for the charm of luck, I decided that it was too dangerous, especially if it fell into the wrong hands. So I made it so that no one else could use it. I said. And I didn't even lie, the charm of luck is gone, and I used the tattoo of luck, that's a completely different matter. And no one but me can use it. That's right, I think so too. Still, it's better not to get involved in such a fundamental thing as luck. So you think girls should use them? Asked Grandpa, nodding his head. Why not? For Ashley, the charm of electrokinesis is perfect. She is used to controlling electricity, so it will be easy for her to use this charm. And she really needs ranged attacks now, until she learns to control her power. And then when she learns, she will always have a source with her to recharge. Some pluses. I said, and catching my breath I continued. Also the charm of telekinesis will suit her. This will give her more agility, which will come in handy for her. In addition, Gwen is already using magic to learn how to use telekinesis. And she will be able to fly in the future too. Will Gwen get the charm of pyrokinesis and resurrection? Asked Grandpa. Yes. Still, Gwen is a magician, albeit an apprentice. In her hands, charms will show their true power. And for the charm of pyrokinesis in the Book of Arcamata there are much more spells. And the charm of resurrection, besides me, can only truly be used by Gwen. I said. Why didn't you take this charms for yourself? Max asked. I already have the Omnitrix. Still, Gwen's main specialization is magic. For me, magic is more secondary. I said. Clear. You just don't want to upset Gwen that she only got one charm. Well done. He acted like a man. Said Grandpa and showed me his thumb. Get away with you. I said and waved my hand at him. Then he got up from his chair and went into the RV.
Since the girls are still asleep, I can devote some time to magic. Therefore, taking the book of elementary magic from the stand where Gwen had put it, I began to read it. An hour later I finished and I remembered everything that was written there. The book really was about elementary magic. First, it described how to test whether a person is capable of becoming a magician. It's useless for me, I'm already a magician. Kind of. Then, if you pass the test, a method was written how to awaken the magic. Also not necessary. Next, how to feel mana. Do not. Point number three is how to start controlling mana. Also don't. Point number four is how to increase control over mana. The method here was not the one I'm using. But in my opinion, my method is better for me, since I am still an anodite and not an ordinary person. Magic loves me and everything is easier for me. So, don't either. But then it was written what I needed. How to use spells. As I thought, can't read a spell just because. If do this, then nothing will work. Although this is not difficult. There are only two steps. The first step, need to give mana to the hand we'll use to conjure. The hand should glow with mana. There is nothing difficult in this, even easier than creating a primitive magic disc. Finally, the second step is to apply mana to the vocal cords. This is necessary in order to use exactly the spell that you need. Can say to influence reality with your voice. Of course, can use the spell mentally, but this requires a lot of experience. And as it is written in the book, there is also one trick here, but need to understand it yourself and then the wizard will really become the master of magic. But I still have a long way to go. Although I think my anodite essence will make the whole process a lot easier. Since I wanted to check everything, I took the book and got off the bus. Where are you going? Asked Grandpa, seeing that I was leaving. By the way, he finally finished fixing the RV. I'm still amazed. There is so much alien technology in this bus, but it still breaks down all the time. How can be both advanced and such junk at the same time? This bus is a mystery of the universe. I want to practice some magic. I said, waving book of magic a little. Okay, just come back in time for dinner, please. Necessarily. I said with a smile and went to the familiar stump. I was there in 10 minutes. Sitting on a tree stump, I opened the book and began to think about which spell to use. 1. Acerbus, a spell that allows the caster to extinguish any nearby source of light. 2. Appendaga Rigoria, this spell can paralyze the target and even keep it in the air if necessary. The effect of the spell disappears as soon as something touches the target. 3. Autumn Forsums, a spell that allows the caster to activate electronic devices. 4. Camera Obliterate, a spell that is used to deactivate surveillance cameras. The caster releases a bubble that surrounds the camera, rendering it useless but not breaking. 5. Camouflat Vaporous, a spell that allows the caster to create massive amounts of vapor for use as cover. In this situation, I can only use two spells. Deciding to do the first, I got up from the stump and took out my phone. Turning on the flashlight, I put it on the center of the stump, screen down. After walking a couple of steps away, I began to chase mana through the body. Aiming more mana to my left hand and vocal cords, I raised my hand and pointed it at the phone, after which I said. Acerbus. After casting the spell, the flashlight on the phone went out. My voice sounded rather loud and solemn. It was easy. I like it. Then I repeated the spell four more times. Having played enough, I decided to cast another spell. After repeating the whole process, I said. Camouflat Vaporous. And in the vicinity, in the blink of an eye, a dense fog appeared. Almost nothing is visible through the fog, but I perfectly felt the whole environment. It looks like it's because the fog is infused with my magic. Quite convenient. Having dispersed the fog by telekinesis, I decided to finish my experiments, especially since it was almost lunchtime. After 10 minutes, I was already there. 
The girls are already awake and grandpa has just finished cooking. After greeting the girls, I sat down at the table and began to eat. It looks like it was an octopus, but I'm not sure. Chapter 32, 31. Training with charms and conversation. After lunch, we all went for a walk around the city. We went on an excursion to another museum. This time, without any witchcraft, a simple museum of paleontology. We saw a few of the main attractions of New Orleans and went to a restaurant. They ate crayfish there, accompanied by beautiful jazz. All in all, we had a good time. A few hours later we returned to the RV, next to which, I asked the girls a question. So what did you decide about the charms? First, we need to use them a little in order to better understand which ones are more suitable for us. Gwen said. I think so too. Ashley said. Okay, then keep the charms yourself. I said and we'll give them four charms. Where's the fifth? Ashley asked. There is no charm of luck, right? Gwen asked. Yes. I got rid of him. He's too dangerous. So only use these. I said. Have you read that old book? Ashley asked. Yes. It was pretty interesting. And useful. I said with a grin, thinking about my new tattoo. And what can you advise us? Gwen asked me with a squint. Apparently, she understood something in my face. Nothing, I wanted to tell her about the tattoo anyway, so it doesn't matter. The charm of resurrection is best for you to take Gwen. Only in the hands of a magician can he fully open up. I will give you a book later, you will read it and understand everything yourself. I said, pointing to the charm in question. And the rest? Ashley asked. You, Ashley, will suit the charm of electrokinesis. You are just very familiar with electricity, it is ideal for you. I would also recommend you the charm of telekinesis, it will give you good maneuverability. I advised. Why isn't the charm of telekinesis for me? Gwen asked curiously. He will certainly be useful to you, but not for long. In the future, you will be able to use spells related to telekinesis. Until then, you can use magic constructs. I said. It is logical. So, the charm of pyrokinesis goes to me? Gwen asked again with a nod. Yes. In the Book of Arcamata, there are quite a few spells for this charm. Again, in your hands it will be more useful. I confirmed. Okay. Then we'll go said Gwen and walked away from our parking lot. Ashley followed her. Underscore. Ashley POV. Moving away from the RV, we stopped in a clearing. Come on then, as Lex said, these are for you, and these are for me. And we will train. Said Gwen and gave me two charms, telekinesis and electrokinesis, and left herself the charms of pyrokinesis and resurrection. Moving a little to the side, I hooked the amulets to the belt. When they were strapped on, I felt a connection with them and instinctively figured out how to manage them. Raising my hand, I fired lightning at the nearest stone. The attack simply shattered the stone. Lex was right, it's very similar to how I used to manage electricity. But with the help of an charm, everything is much easier and feel more freedom. There was no pressure like before and it feels like the energy will never run out. It's just a wonderful feeling. This charm really suits me very well. Next, I decided to check my other charm. Raising my hand again, I wished to pick up the remains of the stone. They took off under my control. Driving them, I attacked the tree. From being hit by stones, the tree broke. Ah, uh, that was strong. And finally, the most important thing. Flight. Wishing to take off, I took off and began to fly across the sky. It was very funny. I never thought it was so cool. After landing on the ground, I began to ponder the results. 
The charms of telekinesis works more at will. You just need to wish and everything will be fulfilled. But with the charms of electrokinesis, everything is different. It feels like I'm using my old abilities, but all the limitations have been lifted from them. Now all I need is fantasy and I can create anything from lightning. These charms are truly incredible, they give so much power without having to learn to control it. Everything has already been given. I'm really lucky to have these charms. I am very glad that I went with them after all. I have no idea what would have happened if I had not met them. Even thinking about it is scary. For about an hour, I practiced in the management of charms, after which I took off and flew to Gwen. I found her 200 meters from the place where we parted. Just when I landed near her, Gwen created balls of fire, making them fly around her. There were already more than 10 of them. Seeing me, she scattered the balls and asked me. Well, how are the charms? Wonderful. Lex was right, as always. These charms are perfect for me. Especially electrokinesis. It feels like my old abilities have been restored to me. I had no idea how much I missed managing electricity. And flying is just wonderful. What about you? I asked, after having told everything. The same. I really like to control fire. Now, I feel like a real sorceress. This is where such opportunities open up. Most importantly, the charm of pyrokinesis gives full immunity to fire, so it's not dangerous for me to use the charm to the maximum. Look! Said Gwen and let go of the streams of fire from her legs and arms. Because of this, she took off and began flying through the air. After a couple of minutes, she landed on the ground, though not very well. Incorrectly placing her foot, she almost fell face down on the ground, but I supported her in time with telekinesis and she was able to stand up normally. Thank you. Gwen thanked me. My pleasure. What about another charm? I said with a wave of my hand. It's more difficult with him. I know how to heal and activate it when I need it. But I need to read the Book of Arcamata to better understand the amulet itself. I seem to be missing something. I hope I can find the answer in the book. Gwen said thoughtfully. Clear. So are you done? Can we go? I asked. Yes. Let's go back already. Gwen said with a smile and we went towards the RV. Listen, Gwen, can I ask you? Having decided to start this conversation, I asked. Oh sure. What do you want to ask? Looking at me, asked Gwen. Are you dating Lex? I asked bluntly. Gwen, because of my question, stumbled and almost fell forward. What? Where did you get this from? Asked all red Gwen. I saw you kissing yesterday. I said. Hearing me, Gwen sighed doomily, covered her face with her hands and said. Yes. We are dating. But your cousins. Does your family mind? I asked uncomprehendingly. My mother said that if this is true love, then she does not mind. Grandpa is of the same opinion. Gwen said with a happy smile. But what about incest and the like? Iski doubtfully. Lex said that due to the nature of Anodite, it doesn't matter. Plus, because of the Omnitrix, his genes change slightly. So, there will definitely be no problems. Gwen said. Clear. I'm glad for you. I said sadly. I just recently realized that I love Lex. And he's already dating Gwen. Now I don't know what to do. You love him? Right? Gwen asked with a smile. What? What are you talking about? Of course not. Trying to make excuses, I said quickly. Come on. And so, everything is clear. Patting me on the shoulder, said Gwen. What? Yes. You're right. I love him. He did so much for me. 
It teaches me to control my abilities. He helped me to make peace with my mother. I can't imagine what would have happened to me if I had not met him. I said with a sigh, blushing. Yes. It's hard not to fall in love after that. Here he is a foo asterisk asterisk ing playboy. Gwen said, waving her fist threateningly. Gwen, don't worry, I won't take him away from you. I said, with apparent sadness. Don't worry about that. I don't mind sharing. Gwen said casually. What? I asked, not understanding anything. You see, Ashley, our Lex has one dream. He wants a harem for himself. Gwen said, frowning a little. Seriously? I asked, arching an eyebrow. Absolutely. I always knew about it. In fact, it wouldn't be surprising if he had multiple girlfriends. Think about it yourself. He is handsome, smart, rich, strong. He has many virtues. Gwen said. Well, yes. I agreed. So, I agreed to a harem. I love him too much to let go. Besides, I'm unlikely to find a second person like him. Gwen said, shaking her head. Is it that simple? I asked doubtfully. Of course not. I will be the first wife and only with my consent, he will be able to add another girl to the harem. Gwen told me. Clever. After thinking a little, I said. That's it. So what do you want in a harem? Gwen said with a huge grin. You, you, seriously? I asked, blushing. Yes. I already know you well. And I like you. You are almost like a sister to me. Gwen said with a nod. But? What will Lex say? I asked nervously. I think he will not mind. The only thing you have to do is talk to him yourself. Putting her hand on her chin, said Gwen. Yes. You're right. I said with determination. Nothing will be solved without talking. While I was gathering my resolve, we reached the RV. Going inside, we saw only Grandpa Max. He was reading a book. Where's Lex? Gwen asked. He opened a new alien and he went to check it. She'll be back in an hour. Said Grandpa, not looking up from the book. Okay. I will then read the book of Arcamata for the time being. I need to know more about the Amulet of Resurrection. Said Gwen, taking the book mentioned. And I decided to practice my cover. Therefore, getting off the bus, I touched the metal and began to absorb it. An hour later, I was exhausted. Now I can hold a full cover for two minutes, but without moving. If I move, the cover immediately falls off. At this moment, Lex just returned, pleased with something. Chapter 33, 32. Ice Pick. When the girls went to train, I decided to do something. Getting on the bus, I picked up the Arcamata Book of Spells. I wanted to secure my tattoo of luck, so when I opened the book to the page where the description of the charm of luck begins, I tore out all the pages. I did it as carefully as possible. Now can't even see that there were once any pages here. I didn't want anyone to know about my tattoo. And here was all the information about her. Even, there was a spell how to remove a tattoo for good. I do not need this. After getting off the bus and moving further away, I turned into the heat eight and burned all the pages. Having regained my human form, I ordered Morgana to delete all the information that I have now burned. I really didn't want to leave a trace. Anyway, I remembered all this when I read it for the first time. I prefer to cover all my weak points, and information about a tattoo is a weak point. I will be much safer if no one finds out about this, even Gwen. When I returned to the bus, the Omnitrix signaled. I knew perfectly well what this signal meant. A new alien has become available. I sometimes don't understand how the Omnitrix works. 
Why would a new alien be available to me right now? How does the clock solve all this? Discarding unnecessary thoughts, I activated the watch and looked at the dial. The silhouette was unfamiliar to me, which is strange because I thought I knew all the aliens from the original Omnitrix. Is it really a completely new and unacquainted alien to me? This have not happened before. I am bursting with curiosity. Looking closely at the alien silhouette, I saw a thin humanoid figure with multiple spikes on its torso and arms. On the head, it seemed, was a sharp hairstyle, like diamond head. There were three fingers on each hand. And that's all I could understand from the silhouette. We'll have to check everything personally. So I went up to Grandpa and said. Grandpa, a new alien has become available to me. I'll go and find out everything about him and practice a little. I'll be back in two hours. Good. But don't go too far. Grandpa said to me. Understood. I said and went into the forest. After walking a few kilometers from the parking lot, I turned into a new alien. This time, I did it the old-fashioned way, otherwise it was already completely rusted. Everything was as usual. After activating the clock, I selected the silhouette of a new hero. Each time, it becomes harder and harder, because this is already my 21st alien. I can't imagine what I would do without master control. Slapping on the clock, I, as always, began to transform from my right hand and my body was covered with a flash of blue light. After the transformation, I examined myself carefully. Now it is clear what those thorns were. My whole body was made of blue ice. And the thorns are ice peaks, instead of hair on the head, there is also solid ice. For some reason, there was a mask on his face that looked more like a respirator. Why is she needed? I do not understand. Well, at least not naked. I was wearing a black and white jumpsuit. The Omnitrix sign, as always, was in the center of the chest. I have not met such an alien in the database of the plumbers of the space. And in a past life I did not see this either. But I already like it. The ice alien will always come in handy. It's time to test your abilities. After an hour and a half, I could already draw some conclusions. But to find out everything for sure, I need to go to the laboratory. Unfortunately, now I cannot do this, I will have to confine myself to what I learned here. First, as you can imagine, I can manage and create ice. This is also called cryokinesis. I can create whatever I want out of ice. And to change my body, though limited, basically only hands. For example, turn hand into a sword or a mace. I can also use something like ice surfing for movement. By the way, very good speed. Secondly, I do not feel pain. Generally. Thirdly, I have a pretty powerful regeneration. I can easily grow my hand. Fourthly, I can change the ambient temperature to create a comfortable temperature for myself. It also helps to weaken enemies. By the way, I don't know for sure the temperature of my ice, but it is, in fact, very strong and does not melt. But I can easily vaporize it if I need it. And fifthly, I can infect enemies with a cold virus in order to weaken them again. That's all I could learn in the field. To find out more I need my laboratory equipment. Of the weaknesses, I understood only the obvious. High temperatures can kill me. Most likely, if enough force is applied, then I can be broken into pieces of ice, but, in theory, I have to get back together. If give me time. In general, I really like the newcomer. He is fast, agile and strong. An alien with the power of ice, in my opinion, is just fine. I decided to call him Icepick. In my opinion, it is very suitable. I practiced for another half hour and decided to go back. It's already time for lunch, and I'm hungry. After 10 minutes I arrived at the RV. As I approached, I saw Ashley sitting and breathing heavily. Apparently she trained her cover and fizzled out. Hey! How's it going with the charms? I asked, going up to Ashley and gave her a hand to help her up. 
Good. Even more. As you said, the charm of electrokinesis really did suit me. He is like my own to me. It is very convenient and easy to use. Ashley said as she put her breath in order. What about the charm of telekinesis? Also good. Controlling it is a little more difficult and not so natural, but still convenient. And the feeling of flying is just wonderful. Ashley said with a smile. Just at that moment, Gwen got off the bus, apparently she heard our voices. Yes, I also liked my charms. Especially, the charm of pyrokinesis. There is a lot can do with it. I even learned to fly, just like you in the image of the heat blast. Said the happy Gwen. This is good. Have you finished the book of elementary magic? I asked. Not yet. I decided to read the book of Arcamata first to learn more about charms. I especially needed information about the charms of resurrection. Gwen said, shaking her head. Were there any problems? I asked. I was missing something. But it's all right now. As soon as I read the book, all my doubts disappeared. And now I understand everything. Said contentedly, Gwen. Well done then. With a smile, I said. By the way, about the book. There is nothing in it at all about the charm of luck. Do you know why? Gwen asked curiously. I'll tell you everything later. I said. Okay. Then we went inside. Grandpa finished cooking. Today there seems to be simple pasta. Gwen said. Is it really an ordinary and not an exotic dish? I asked doubtfully. Looks like that. Said Gwen and went into the house. Ashley followed her and I followed Ashley. Gwen was right, there was simple pasta for dinner. But the whole point was in the sauce. I think I could smell the squid ink. Well, it doesn't matter, and I ate not that much. After dinner everyone went about their own business. Grandpa immediately went to bed. Gwen continued reading the book of elementary magic. Ashley was watching a movie on my laptop. I decided to fix the charms on the belts with the girls' costumes. I have set up special pockets that will hide the charms themselves. I think, not the best idea to shine them. You never know what crazy magician wants to pocket charms of bezels. Let them always be with the girls, but no one will know about it. I finished, just as Ashley fell asleep. So we can go out. Gwen, everyone is already asleep. Let's go on a date. I said quietly to Gwen that she was focused on the book. Yes? Is it time already? Come on, of course. Said Gwen and jumped up from the sofa. We quietly got off the bus and headed into the city. Due to the fact that it was already dark, artificial light was turned on in the city, this made the city truly beautiful. First, we walked a bit and looked at the local architecture. When we got hungry, we decided to buy a hot dog. And of course, everything could not do without robbers. Do we really have such a fate? Some two idiots decided to rob an old woman. And they stole her purse. Again, I didn't have to do anything. Gwen threw magic discs in their faces, from which they immediately lost consciousness. And most importantly, everything happened so quickly that no one but me noticed anything. Old woman went to the thieves and took her bag. Then she hit them on the head with the same bag. Strongly, I must say, she was blown away. There will definitely be a concussion. After eating hot dogs, we went for a walk. During the walk, Gwen asked me. So, why was there nothing in the book of Arcamata about the charms of luck? I destroyed all information. I honestly said. What? What for? The girl asked uncomprehendingly. And, I told her everything. About how I tied the charm to himself and turned it into a tattoo of luck and the rest. Clear. But was it really necessary to destroy the only information about this charm? 
Gwen asked. It's just in case. But still, I remembered everything. I said. We walked for about an hour and then went back. Halfway to the bus, Gwen said. Ashley found out that we are dating. Yes? How? I asked with interest. She saw us kissing yesterday. Slightly blushing, said Gwen. Clear. And what did you tell her? I asked. Everything. I told the whole truth about our relationship. Gwen said honestly. And about, I started to ask, but I was interrupted. Yes. And about the harem too. Gwen said and rolled her eyes. So what did she say? I asked curiously, hoping for a positive reaction. You don't seem to know? Do you know that she loves you? Once again rolling her eyes, said Gwen. It's not hard to guess. I said truthfully. Well, here it is. I said she needed to talk to you first. And only then decide everything. Gwen said with a shrug. You said right. Well then, I'll talk to her later. I said with a nod. Good. Gwen said without even showing any negative attitude. After that, we did not talk, but only walked to the RV, holding hands. It was a cozy silence. When we got to the bus, we stayed outside and kissed for about 20 minutes. After that, we immediately went to bed. Chapter 34, 33 The Forever Knight's Castle June 22, 2010 The next morning, we went to a cafe for breakfast. And of course, it couldn't be that simple. As we walked near the construction site, two workers fell from a great height due to a broken cable. Again, I didn't have to do anything. Ashley used the power of her charm and captured the construction workers with telekinesis. The workers calmly landed on the ground, not understanding anything. And again, no one except us understood anything. Ashley is great, she did everything quickly and cleanly. She perfectly understands that I do not like attention. For me, even if no one knows that we exist. Glory is certainly wonderful, for some. But for me, she's only a problem. After rescuing the builders, we went to a cafe and ate. Finally, the most common food. I missed so much. After breakfast, we got back on the bus and drove to our next destination. Grandpa decided to make us another surprise and took us to the aqua park. Vilgax is coming soon, so I decided to rest as much as possible. While there is time. I spent the whole day having fun at the park. Ride each slide three times. Despite my increased stamina, I was very tired. So after having dinner, I immediately fell asleep. It was a very long and very short day at the same time. But I had a lot of fun. Underscore. June 23, 2010. I woke up very rested and full of energy. When I was brushing my teeth, I remembered one thing. This aqua park has a story with the original Ben. Due to his small stature, Ben could not ride one of the slides and therefore he wanted to turn into a tall alien. But for him, as always, everything went wrong, and he became a grey matter. After that, he was kidnapped by a crazy alien lover. This lover wanted to sell Ben, as a grey matter form, to the Forever Knights. But despite the fact that they are kind of like knights, no honor in them a penny. And they betrayed the crazy guy and wanted to kill him. In general, it all ended with Ben destroying the castle of the Forever Knights. He's just not far from here. Why did I remember this? This castle has a good collection of alien technology. I am in such a mood now and I want to do something. It was still early morning, everyone was still asleep. Even Grandpa. Apparently, they were very tired yesterday. So I decided to succumb to my mood and turned into my favorite runner, I ran towards the castle of the Forever Knights. At first, I wanted to do it the old-fashioned way, turn into a ghost freak, get inside and borrow everything I need. But again, my mood today is not the same. 
I decided to get inside by force. And don't even use the power of the aliens. I realized that this would give me problems. But I will face the forever knights in the future. One invasion of their castle won't change anything. First, running closer to the castle, I became myself and put on my suit. After that, I sent a wave of echolocation to the entire castle. Apparently, there are exactly 50 people in the castle now. And the place I'm looking for is on the second floor. Approaching the main entrance, I hit it with my foot. From the blow, the heavy wooden door was simply knocked out. I think I accidentally shot down a couple of knights. And really knocked down, they are lying under the door. Well, minus two. Going inside, I noticed a large number of closed-circuit television cameras. Since I don't want to be filmed, I used a spell. Camera Oblitera. I raised my hand and chanted a spell. This time I used 10 times more mana than usual. From my hand, 10 blue bubbles came out that covered all the cameras in the corridor. With this, I wanted to check a few things. First, does my magic work in a suit? Although I already knew what was working. After all, I myself created it and took into account such moments. But you always need to check. Secondly, what happens if I supply several times more mana than is needed for the spell? I had several hypotheses. First, the spell will just get stronger. Second, nothing will happen, and the extra mana will simply go into the air. And third, the spell is duplicated. As can see, the third hypothesis was correct. I am even very pleased with this. Will not need to cast spells several times in such situations. It will also be necessary to check whether it is possible to increase the power of the spell if I increase the amount of mana in a different way. Something I was thinking. There are already a dozen knights running. Apparently they heard a noise. Since I decided not to use aliens, but to fight only with my body and martial arts, I need a weapon. Raising my hand to chest level, I concentrated. I did it the first time after all. 10 seconds later, the staff bow, 2 meters long, appeared in my hand. It was created from my mana, so it was blue. But it was very dense and opaque. If you don't look closely, it seems that it is real, just of an unusual color. This, by the way, is the consequence of the fact that I have absorbed all the magic of the staff of Hex. Satisfied with the result, I took the staff tighter in my right hand and looked at the approaching Forever Knights. There were about 20 of them. Finally, when they got there, they started talking about the invasion and that kind of nonsense. I did not listen to them and ran towards them with a staff at the ready. Seeing that I was not listening, and generally ran to the attack, they got angry and started shooting at me with their laser spears. I either dodged the shots or took them on my staff. Since it is magical, the staff is capable of absorbing energy and dissipating it. He doesn't care about laser shots. Having reached them, I attacked. Using my fighting skills, I knocked out all the knights in just a minute. Minus 25. Half left. They are kind of like knights, and they even have spears and swords, but they absolutely do not know how to fight. As the era, so are the knights. Having finished with them, I ran to the second floor. Once I got up, I used the spell again and covered all the cameras. Just in case. This time, 10 knights greeted me. It took me 2 minutes to complete them. These already knew how to fight a little. Minus 35. Further, I ran to the main hall. The rest of the knights were there, except for 3. Arriving there, I saw a large alien cannon, whose muzzle pointed directly at me. Oh, looks like a trap was set for me. Noticing me, the knights activated their weapons. And a laser shot with a diameter of a meter flew in my direction. I was too lazy to do anything with him, so I just flew up with the help of telekinesis. The shot went right under my feet, destroying the half of the castle in the process. Well at least the collection of alien equipment was on the other side of the castle. Idiots. I said, my voice changed because of the mask. 
All the knights that were in the hall looked in shock at the destruction they had arranged. Hearing me, they just got mad and started yelling at me. Wow, how many bad words there were. Pawn's ears. Not listening to their screams, I landed in the center of the night cluster and began to exterminate them. I coped with them in just half a minute. Minus 47. Having examined the whole room, or rather everything that was left of it, I saw a door. She just led where I needed. But there were three knights inside. It was Enoch and two of his subordinates. The Enoch is local leader. He is the section head of this branch of the Forever Knights. I already had some fun, so I decided to finish quickly. Going inside, I immediately attacked them. They obviously did not expect such harsh actions from me, so they were a little confused. Well, yes, they thought that I would start a dialogue, as is their custom here. Yeah, I have nothing else to do. The two knights were very capable. Obviously the best I've met today. No wonder they were the personal bodyguards of Enoch. But I quickly coped with them. And the Enoch himself was a complete disappointment. I thought, since he is a whole section head, he must be strong. If only. He's still a weakling. Seeing how I defeated his bodyguards, all his arrogance subsided, and he asked me for mercy. And this is the knight? I felt really disgusted, so I just hit him on the head with a staff and knocked him out. Not forever, of course. A similar desire arose, I confess, but I immediately changed my mind. I just don't want to mess with him. And that was minus 50. Having dispersed Bo's staff, I went to inspect the collection. There was a lot here, but only a few things interested me. Firstly, there was a very good core for a spaceship. This type of core is incredibly rare in the galaxy. The core was broken, of course, but if I fix it and put it in the ship, I get an incredibly fast transport perhaps even one of the fastest in the universe. Also, I found a couple more parts to fix the core itself. Secondly, there were a large number of crystals that the knights used to create their laser spears. These crystals are similar to those used in the Star Wars universe to create lightsabers, but they are slightly different and need to be used in a special way. It's good that Morgana had hacked the Forever Knights network long ago, and there was a way to process these crystals. I took all the crystals that were here. They will be useful to me, I have long wanted to make weapons for some of my aliens. Thirdly, I found something that just blew my brain. On one of the stands lay a small cube, the size of a regular dice. I immediately understood what it was. One day, I read in the plumber's database about the once powerful race that once ruled the entire galaxy. As always happens in such situations, this race was overthrown. So, they were so strong thanks to their special technology associated with magic. This little cube is part of their technology. There was almost nothing in the database about this race, but it was written about this cube. This simple-looking, small cube is a spatial storage. Undoubtedly a very useful thing. I just missed something like that. I was overwhelmed with joy. Therefore, I quickly took a cube and activated it with my magic power. I had little time, so I quickly put all my purchases in a cube. Also, I collected all consumables from the warehouse. There were several laser spears, and also various metals, crystals, and the like. After taking everything, I turned into an XLR8 and returned to my family. They should have woken up by now. Chapter 35, 34. Two Tales. Before returning to the RV, I decided to run into my lab to leave all the possessions I had confiscated there. Arriving at the laboratory, I submitted my mana to the cube and took out everything that I took from the Forever Knights. The core of the ship and the parts to repair it, I put in the warehouse. All consumables and crystals went to storage. I left the Knight Spears in the lab for now, I'll deal with them later. I was about to leave the cube itself, too, when I noticed that there was something else inside. It was a container. And inside was a DNA sample. As I understand it, 
This is the DNA of the same extinct race that was once the ruler of the galaxy. This race was called Telemat. They lived on the planet Arunian. This is practically all that is known about them. This cube is produced by this race. I had a great desire to immediately scan this sample with the Omnitrix and get an alien of this race. But I have no time. I have to go. So for now, I left everything in the lab and dashed off to the RV. I arrived just when everyone got up and noticed that I was not. Good morning. I said, regaining my human form. Morning. Where have you been? Max asked me. I ran to the laboratory on a small matter. I lied, not telling about my sortie. Grandpa doesn't like it when I do something illegal, so I decided not to tell anything. Something happened? Asked Grandpa. No, everything is okay. In fact, everything is just fine. I said with a wide smile, pleased with my little robbery. This is good. Let's go have breakfast. Seeing that I was in a good mood, Max said with a smile. Grandpa called Ashley and Gwen, and together we went to the nearest cafe for breakfast. After eating, we returned to the RV and hit the road. We drove for several hours until, at Gwen's request, Grandpa stopped the bus in a desert area. She wanted to practice magic. Ashley also agreed, as she also wanted to practice a little. The mobile home stopped near the forest. Coming out of the transport, Gwen immediately took a small magic grimoire and rode into the depths of the thicket, shaking with impatience. Ashley, too, immediately flew into the forest, she wanted to practice a full cover of stone and wood. What are you going to do? Grandpa asked me when we were alone. I need to get back to the lab. There were unfinished business there. What are you going to do? I said and asked about grandfather's plans. I wanted to clean the bus and take an inventory. Max said. Can I help you? Quickly. I asked, pointing to my watch. There is no need. I can handle it myself. You can go about your business. Grandpa said with a smile. Well, my job is to propose. Okay, I'll be back in a few hours. Do not be bored. I said, and having turned into XLR8, I ran to the laboratory. Arriving at my cave, the first thing I did was to take a closer look at my new spatial storage. As I said, telemates were powerful thanks to their technomagic artifacts. This was confirmed after I used the storage with my mana. Looking closely at this small cube, I noticed several inscribed runes. The metal from which the cube was made was unknown to me. After feeding some mana into it, I decided to check its capacity. It turned out that there was 4 cubic meters of free space inside. It's not too much, but that's enough for me. Unfortunately, there was nothing else inside. Oh, how I wish there was something else inside besides DNA. For example, another technomagic treasure. Well, what is not, that is not. After checking the entire cube again, I did not find anything else, either inside or outside. But it seemed to me that something was missing. Since this is partly a magical artifact, I decided to do it magically. At first, I just fed the cube with my mana for a few minutes. In the end, nothing interesting happened. After 10 minutes, I still decided to stop this activity, moving on to plan number 2. I cut my hand with a knife and sprinkled my blood on the cube. It's still magic, and without blood nothing works in it. Oddly enough, but my strange logic worked. After absorbing about half a liter of my blood, the cube shone blue, it looks like I fed it with my mana for a reason, and it turned into a futuristic black ring. Taking the ring in my left hand, I put it on the middle finger of my right hand. Once on my finger, the ring tightened and grabbed it tightly. Taking my phone in my right hand, I wished it to disappear. And he disappeared. Wishing for the phone to return, he appeared, right in my hand. Very comfortably. After checking the ring a few more times with other things, I was very pleased with my purchase. 
Finally, I put all the DNA samples of my aliens inside my new storage, now they will always be with me. The phone was in the same place. Having finished with the cube, or rather with the ring, I picked up a container with Telemat's DNA, presumably. I'm not stupid enough to scan a sample with Omnitrix right away. You never know what is there. So I took a small piece of DNA and ran a few tests. Thank God everything turned out to be safe. And I even learned a thing or two about this alien. According to the analyses, this alien must be physically weak, even weaker than an ordinary man. But because of my serum, this problem is leveled. I did not read further, I just checked if everything was in order. It won't be interesting that way. I want to find out everything myself. Finally, I scanned the sample with Omnitrix. The Omnitrix flashed yellow and scanned the DNA. After 10 seconds everything was over and the Omnitrix was ready to go. After activating the watch, I scrolled the dial to a new silhouette. The figure at the silhouette was humanoid and its lush coat was clearly visible. He had lop-eared ears on his head. The most, in my opinion, a distinctive feature of the alien were two long tails. Without waiting any longer, I slapped the dial. After a second, I took the form of a new alien and examined myself. I was only a meter tall, and I had two two-meter tails. It looks like I can control these tails like hands. They can also stretch up to 5 meters. And I still have complete control over them. I had a yellow coat with black spots all over my body. I was dressed in a black and blue overalls. The Omnitrix symbol, as always, was on the chest. And there were claws on the arms and legs. To be honest, I was now very similar to Marsupolami, a fictional character in French comics. Only I was dressed. Having finished examining myself, I decided to test my powers. The physical strength of the two tails, as I decided to call this alien, was really not very impressive. It was only thanks to the serum that I was not a weakling in this form. In two tails form, I was about one and a half times stronger than in human form. Compared to some aliens, this is very small. Even a slug is stronger, and yet it consists of a slurry. Still, Two Tails was incredibly agile and fast. And his tails are just terrible power. They are strong, flexible, and stretchable. These tails can be used both as a weapon and as a means of transportation. I especially enjoyed flying with tails like Spider-Man. It was incredible, much more fun than flying with telekinesis. Then I tested the main power of the two tails. And this is teleportation. I can teleport to places where I have been at least once and any place in my field of vision. I can also teleport anything that I can pick up. But this is only two and a half tons of weight. This is an incredible ability. And most importantly, I got rid of the main weakness of this race. To teleport, I used the special energy of this alien, somewhat similar to my mana, but slightly different. It turned out that teleportation is not the ability of telemates, but a magical technique, but over time, it turned into an instinct. As I understand it, the amount of this energy is related to physical strength. Without the serum, I would be weaker than a common man, but I could still use my teleportation with almost no restrictions. And now I have enough energy to teleport to the other side of the galaxy and return back. And the energy will also remain. Apparently, therefore, the Two Tails race decided to focus on their techno-magic. And they used her special magical energy as a basis. But from weaknesses, I only have a dislike for water, like cats. All in all, I was very pleased with my excursion to the Forever Nights. I got not only spatial storage, but an incredibly useful alien as well. And that's not counting everything else that is now in the warehouse. After all the tests, I did some more tails training. And then I decided to have some fun with teleportation. First, I teleported to my house, then to France, where I once visited with grandfather, and then to all the cities of our summer tour. Having played enough, I happily teleported directly to the RV. Triple A. F asterisk CK Lex, don't ever do that again.
Grandpa shouted, clutching his heart. Looks like I scared him with my sudden appearance. And he recognized me by the symbol of the Omnitrix. Sorry, Grandpa. I did not want. I said in a childish voice, trying to contain my laughter. Is this another new alien? Recovered, Max asked. Yes, and you will never guess who it is. I said in an intriguing voice. Really, and who is it? Asked the grandfather with curiosity. This is Telemat. I proclaimed solemnly. Are you serious? Max asked in shock. Absolutely. This is a real Telemat. I named it Two Tails. I said with a smile. But they became extinct tens thousands years ago. Many people think they are just a myth. Even the plumbers found out about them by accident. And even then, we only know about their unusual technologies and the name of their race. And it's all. Did Azimus find their DNA and add it to the Omnitrix? Not. I found it. I said and turned into myself. Then I called the phone from my ring. Is it really a spatial cube of telemates? With even greater shock, asked the grandfather. Yes. I found it quite by accident. If I hadn't read the plumber's database, I would never have thought that an ordinary-looking small cube is a high-tech magic artifact. Inside was a sample of Telemat's DNA. I said, showing off the ring. Was there something else inside? Examining my ring, asked Grandpa. Unfortunately, no. I said, shaking my head. Well, you already got a lot. Max said soothingly. You're right about that. Okay, I'll go get the girls, otherwise it's time to have supper. I said and went into the forest. Chapter 36, 35 Lord of the Wasps Using echolocation with my glasses, I found girls. Gwen was only a kilometer from the bus, and Ashley flew away by a full five. I decided to get Ashley first. Turning into XLR8, I ran to her. At the moment she was sitting on a large boulder and using the full stone cover. Seeing me, Ashley threw off her cover and waved her hand at me. Then she jumped off the stone and ran to me. After cancelling the transformation, I asked. Well, how are you? Very good. The stone is easier to work with. Now I can hold the cover for five minutes. But if I move, it flies all the time. Well, it's a matter of practice. Don't worry, it will work out in time. What about charms? Encouraging her, I said. Everything is fine here, especially with the charm of electrokinesis. I have practiced a little, but I think I already have enough practice with them. I already managed them well. Said a pleased Ashley. This is good. Well, let's go. Otherwise, it will soon get dark. I said. Oh, sure. But let's take a walk. I want to take a little walk, Ashley said, blushing. Okay, since you want to walk, let's go on foot. I said and walked towards Gwen. Ashley followed me. We already walked for five minutes, but we were still silent. Ashley was clearly eager to say something, but she didn't dare. After another five minutes I got tired of it, so I asked. Ashley, is there something you want to tell me? Not. That is, yes. That is, no. Ashley muttered quickly. First, calm down, and then answer. I said. Sighing a couple of times, Ashley calmed down and looked straight at me with determination in her eyes. I love you. Ashley blurted out and closed her eyes in anticipation of an answer. I know. Imitating Han Solo, I said. What? Ashley asked, shocked. I know. It was very easy to understand. And Gwen told me about your conversation. I said with a shrug. And she really loves me. This is truly true love, not admiration or simple gratitude. 
I even specifically tested it using telepathy. Although not pretty, I needed to be sure. And what do you think about this? Ashley asked nervously. You are beautiful, funny and kind. I like you. I honestly said. Truth? Ashley asked in shock. Yes. But first I have to tell you something. When I first saw you, I didn't really like you at first. I thought you were the kind of person who uses superpowers only for yourself and never thinks about the consequences. But then, I got to know you better and I have to apologize for thinking so of you, suspecting bad things. Please forgive me. I said sincerely. It really tormented me. At first, I constantly compared Ashley to Kevin. But that was wrong. And now I'm a little ashamed. What do you think of me now? Ashley asked. As I said, I like you. You are a really strong person. I said with a smile. Good. But to deserve my forgiveness, you need to do something for me. Ashley said with a sly grin. Yes? And what? I asked with a similar grin. Kiss me boldly said Ashley, with red cheeks. It's easy. I said with a smile and kissed Ashley. The kiss lasted almost 10 minutes until we ran out of air. Fa. It was cool. Said the red, but clearly pleased Ashley. Yes. Not bad. I said and kissed her again. After the second kiss, I decided to continue the conversation. Ashley, did Gwen tell you everything? I asked. You mean the harem? Yes, she talked about your little dream. Ashley said. And you are not against other girls? I asked. I love you too much. Where can I find someone like you? I agree to the harem, but with the conditions. Ashley said raising her finger up. I'm listening. Feeling deja vu, I said. I will be the second wife, after Gwen. And in order to add new girls to the harem, you need my consent with Gwen. Ashley said. Certainly. This is out of the question. I said instantly. Then good. Ashley said and reached for me for a kiss. I did not refuse her and kissed her again. In the end, we kissed for another 15 minutes, after which we decided to go after Gwen. In order not to waste time, I turned into XLR8 and grabbed Ashley in my arms, ran to Gwen. Gwen was also in the clearing, now sitting on a tree stump reading a grimoire. Running up to Gwen, I put Ashley on her feet and became myself. Gwen saw Ashley happy and said sagaciously. I see you talked. Yes. And not only. I said with a grin. Ashley blushed again. So, how is the study of magic going? I asked. Badly. I can't seem to create a spell. Said Gwen at once saddened. Did you do everything as written in the book? I asked. Yes. My cousin said with a nod. First made mana move along the body, then gave it to the arm and vocal cords? I asked again. Yes. Stop. What? Need to move mana through the body? Gwen asked in shock. Well, yes. You must first use the flow of magic. A little. Just for the magic to start working. I said with a nod. But nothing is written about it here. Said Gwen, who stood up abruptly and pointed her finger at the book. You need to read it carefully. This is written at the very beginning. I said confidently. Hearing me, Gwen immediately began leafing through the grimoire. In a minute she found what she was looking for. Indeed it is written. And how did I not notice? Gwen said with a frown. Most likely, you deliberately missed it, since there was no interesting information. I said, knowing full well that it was so. Gwen ignored my words and decided to cast the spell. This time, she did everything right and a fog appeared around us. I managed. Happened. 
said, jumping happily, Gwen. Well done, well done. But that's all for today. It's time for us to leave. Grandpa was already waiting. I said, soothing her. I turned into two tails, and grabbing the girls with my tails, teleported to grandfather. The girls did not even have time to understand anything, as we were there and I became a man again. Coming to her senses, Wen asked. A new alien? Yes. I'll tell everything during the meal. I said and went to eat. After dinner, everyone went about their business. And I immediately went to bed. Today has been a long day. Underscore. June 24, 2010. The next morning, as always, after breakfast, we hit the road. Our next destination was Baltimore, Maryland. In a couple of hours, we were already entering the city. And as always, a robber appeared. This time it was the hijacker. He stole such a good car and was now trying to break away from the police. This would-be driver almost caught our bus. The girls were about to start acting, but I stopped them. I myself. I also need to be entertained sometimes. I said and went to the front of the bus. Now the stolen car was driving in front of us so I could use my new alien. Transformed into two tails, I teleported to the adjacent seat right next to the hijacker. Lucky it was a cabriolet. Seeing me, the driver just went crazy. Not wasting time, I hit him in the head. From this he immediately passed out. Transformed into an upgrade, I soaked into the car and took control of it. Then I calmly parked the convertible and left the bandit to the police. Transformed into the ghost freak, I returned to the RV. My family was not at all surprised at my phantom appearance. They are already used to it. Next, Grandpa went to Chinatown. There he wanted to buy something for dinner. I'm already afraid to imagine what it will be. Coincidentally, there was a parade in honor of some Chinese holiday. Since we weren't busy, we decided to watch the parade itself. An hour later, the parade ended, and the mayor of Baltimore took the stage and began to talk about the reconstruction of the area. Before she could finish her speech, a swarm of wasps suddenly appeared in the street. And a man appeared near the stage who was standing on a cloud of wasps, which made it seem that he was flying. This man looked, I must say, so so. He was wearing an old shabby jacket and a hood over his head. But the strangest thing is his blue skin. Is that cold to him? Well, I'll warm him up. He had already started his villainous monologue and tried to kidnap the mayor, but I didn't wait any longer. I turned into a heat blast and flew at this asshole. The girls at this time were already destroying those wasps that attacked civilians. Those wasps that wanted to attack me just burned out. The wasp lover had almost taken the mayor, but he never noticed me. So I just flew past and grabbed his jacket and then flew up. I specifically controlled the fire so as not to harm it. The Lord of the Wasps, of course, tried to fight back, but he did not succeed. And all the wasps that he set on me, again just burned up. When we were at an altitude of a kilometer, I decided to stop and take a close look at the intruder. Looking closely, I realized how he controls insects. He is telepathic, but weak. And all his power is to control and talk to insects. I don't know where he got such power. Most likely he's just another mutant. But I know how to deprive him of this strength. He has a special, mental channel for controlling insects. With my telepathy, I shut it down forever. Now he is a simple man. Scary though. Now he will have a headache for two months, but that's okay. The consequences of treatment. After finishing with the mutant that had passed out, I flew to the ground. Throwing it at the feet of the police, I flew up again. When no one saw me, I turned into two tails and teleported to our mobile home. There was no one inside yet. My family returned only after 10 minutes. Well, how? Asked Grandpa when he saw me. Things are good. It was a mutant. He knew how to control insects, 
but I blocked his forces and gave the police. What do you have? I said. Likewise. People hardly suffered. The girls killed the wasps until they just flew away. But there is one problem. Said Grandpa. Which? I asked, frowning. Looks like Ashley is sick. Max said. Chapter 37, 36. Sword. Yeah, it looks like Ashley did indeed catch a cold. She felt bad since the morning, but she said nothing. And during the fight, she get warm and after she got worse. Now she has a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius, also has a cough and a runny nose. Grandpa decided to prepare a Chinese folk medicine. It's scary smelly, but it really works. I have never been sick because of my special body, but I saw Grandpa taking this medicine himself and he was fine the very next day. Grandpa and Gwen went to Chinatown again to buy a special route for the medicine. I stayed behind to follow Ashley. I put her on the bed and covered her with a blanket. After a couple of minutes, she was already asleep. Half an hour later, Grandpa and Gwen returned. Max prepared his medicine and forcefully gave Ashley a drink. For the rest of the day, we took turns taking care of Ashley. By evening she felt better and was able to eat. Then she fell asleep. Underscore. June 25, 2010. The next day, Ashley was already completely recovered and we were able to hit the road. We again decided to stop near the forest so that the girls could continue their training. I, again, decided to go to the laboratory. Transformed into the two tails, I teleported to my cave. I have long wanted to make a weapon for the four arms. I realize I won't use it very often, but it's incredibly cool. Moreover, if, for example, there is an invasion of robots, the four arms with weapons will simply be a death machine. Still, can't achieve much only with fists. The first thing I did when I arrived at the lab, I took the spears of the knights and took them apart. I knew how these spears worked thanks to the information Morgana obtained from the Forever Knights, but I wanted to see it in person. Everything was the same as in the information. A special crystal that did not have a name, so I decided to name it Cyber Crystal, is inserted into a special groove. With it, you can attack from a distance, but also accept attacks from close. Not a bad idea, but I have a better one. Having finished disassembling the spear, I sat down at the computer and began designing a weapon for my tetramand. Of course I want to create a sword. It will be more than 2 meters. The shape will not be standard, but the cutting edge will be on both sides. The handle will also be elongated so that it can be held with both hands. Still, for arms hands are not small. The sword will consist of an alloy of three space metals. The first of the metals is alamantium. A rare, incredibly durable metal commonly used to enhance the defense of spaceships in weak spots. Alamantium will give the sword strength and durability. The second metal, Lamanchus, is an especially light, but strong metal, from which the skeletons of spaceships are made. Lamanchus will reduce the weight of the sword and give it good balance. Plus, the guard and handle will be made from this metal. The last metal of Xantium will go to the edge. He will give the sword an incredible sharpness. Also, thanks to this metal, the sword will not need to be sharpened. But the most important thing will be hidden in the guard. I will add a cyber crystal there. My sword will not be a lightsaber, but thanks to the crystal, a laser edge will appear around the entire blade. This will increase the sword's penetrating power and will easily cut through the toughest materials. Also, I decided to add one more mechanism. On the pommel, I will install a special device that will return the sword to the bracelet, which I will wear in the form of the forearms. When I finished designing, I went to get all the materials I needed. Fortunately, the warehouse had everything we needed. Having found everything, I turned into the heat blast and with the help of his flame began to melt all three metals. First, I destroyed all the impurities, and then, using telekinesis, I began to mix the metals. 
Having completed this stage, I gave the liquid molten metal the shape of my future sword and, finally, squeezed the metal itself using telekinesis. Half an hour later, I brought the sword to perfection. Then, it's time to temper. I did not use oil or water, but a special space slurry that is used in the galaxy. An expensive piece, but I was lucky and there was a whole canister in the warehouse. When I finished hardening the sword, I left it to cool. It's time to make the guard. I made guard with my equipment. It wasn't hard. In the guard itself, I immediately added all the necessary components to create a laser edge. I also added cyber crystal. When the guard was ready, I made a device for returning the sword to the owner, which I attached to the pommel. In order to have something to summon a sword, I also created a bracelet. It will be stored in my space ring, along with the sword. And when I need it, I'll take it out and put it on my arm. By the way, yes, I can summon an alien-shaped ring. The ring changes its shape and usually appears on one of the fingers. If there are no fingers, then the ring becomes a bracelet. Now that everything is ready, it's time to collect the sword. Taking the blade itself, despite the addition of special metal to reduce weight, weight is 350 kilograms, I attached a guard and a pommel. Then I wrapped the handle with leather to make it more comfortable to hold. I had to run to the market for leather. My sword for Tetramand was ready. It weighed 360 kilograms and was 220 centimeters long. For a human it is just a huge sword, but for a four-armed one, just in size. After sending the sword and bracelet to my inventory, I headed to the training ground. Once there, I turned into four arms and summoned my ring, took out my new sword and bracelet. I put the bracelet on the upper first hand, after which I began to train with the sword. Thanks to its four-handedness, the sword just fluttered in my hands and became a deadly weapon. After finishing my warm-up, I activated the lightsaber mode. After pressing the guard, a blue laser edge appeared around the blade. Now he could cut almost anything. After turning off the laser sword mode, I decided to test the work of the bracelet. I threw the sword away and activated the bracelet. The bracelet lit up, and the sword froze in the air, and then flew towards me. Turning off the bracelet, I caught the sword and continued my training. It took me several hours to get used to the sword. I can say two things about the sword. It's incredibly cool and comfortable. I am completely satisfied. Having finished with everything, I returned the sword and bracelet back and turned into the two tails, teleported to the RV. The girls have just returned. Today they have only slightly improved their skills. We ate and then just rested. Underscore. June 26th to 29th, 2010. The next three days were spent preparing for the coming of Vilgax. I knew that he would arrive soon, so I spent all my free time at the training ground. I was finally able to do a full workout with the ice pick. Although I did not learn anything new, except for the temperature of its ice, which turned out to be equal to absolute zero. But at least I'm used to this alien. Also, due to the serum, I am still not very used to increasing the physical strength of some aliens. Therefore, I got used to the increase in strength. The problems were mainly with the wrath and gray matter. The serum made the wrath go crazy with his improved senses. When I turned into him, I got a sensory shock. The wild mud had the same problem, but due to his more highly specialized senses, it was easier with him. The gray matter was the biggest problem. When a great strength suddenly appeared in such a small body, it was very difficult to get used to it. I spent the whole day on it. With the rest of the aliens, everything was better, but I still barely made it. And I'm not sure about Krob, I think I'm not yet fully used to him. On the other hand, such training was beneficial, because I met all the aliens, whom I practically did not devote time to before. Also, I climbed into the Omnitrix one more time. Didn't do anything significant, only reduced the transformation time to one second. This is all that I could do with the watch and the time available to me. 
Of course, I did not forget to devote time to magic and was able to improve my control over it a little. Now my constructions are much stronger. Plus, I was able to learn a couple of new tricks. For example, tentacles. They can sometimes come in handy. This is all I have done. I have done everything I can to prepare for Vilgax's arrival. So on the last day, I decided to relax a little and asked Ashley out on a date. We had a really good time and kissed a lot. But as always, everything could not go without the robbers. This time there were hijackers who stole a collector's car and took a hostage. Ashley and I were just walking along the road and the hijackers drove along it, and the police were driving behind them. A bit annoyed at being interrupted, I decided to end them quickly. First, I scanned the car, using echolocation, for the location of the thieves and the hostage. Then, having turned into Jet Ray, I flew after the collector's car. Once above her, I turned into four arms and drew my sword. In the end, I cut the car exactly in half. The collection vehicle was rear-wheel drive, so it stopped immediately. Taking out the hostage, I carefully set him aside. After that, I rudely took out the robbers and knocked them out in my favorite way, with a blow to the head, and threw them on the asphalt. When I was done, I turned into XLR8 and went back to Ashley. I think I was caught on camera from a helicopter. It's not good, but I had no choice. After returning to Ashley, we walked a little more, and then got back on the bus and immediately went to bed. Tomorrow will be a long day. Our next destination is Mount Rushmore. Chapter 38, 37. Vilgax. June 29, 2010. On the Vilgax spaceship. On the bridge of the ship, the screens were showing the report of the news channel from Earth. The video showed Lex's hero act. How he flew in, cut the car, rescued the hostage and knocked out the hijackers. Then he fled from the scene of the crime. This report was watched by the Vilgax soldier and Vilgax himself, who was still in the healing capsule. After finishing watching the report, Vilgax said with contempt in his voice. The power of the Omnitrix is wasted on mindless heroism. Send more robots? The soldier asked. Not. Vilgax barked and opened his capsule. A completely healthy Vilgax came out of the capsule. In fact, he is even stronger than before. I myself begin to solve this problem. Said Vilgax pompously. Lex POV. June 30, 2010. At 3 o'clock in the morning, Grandpa woke us up. He said that he had a nightmare in which Vilgax appeared. In a dream, the alien said that he would soon come for us. Usually Grandpa is not superstitious, but he reacts very sharply to everything connected with Vilgax. Plus, a couple of days ago, I told him I had a bad feeling about it. And I reminded him that we had not seen the robots of Vilgax for a long time. Max, by the way, in such situations listens to me, because he knows that usually I'm right. Therefore, he decided to hit the road immediately, despite the protests of the girls. I didn't mind, because that was the way it had to be. Grandpa immediately got behind the wheel and we quickly drove towards Mount Rushmore. Underscore. Third POV. On the main bridge of the ship, Vilgax, already completely healthy, was sitting in his captain's chair, which looked more like a throne. Did you find a way to track the Omnitrix? Vilgax asked. No, sir. The host removed the ability to track. Sometimes we can catch his signal, but this happens completely by accident. And at the moment, we cannot find it. Replied the head of the research department, who looked like any other Vilgax soldier. I'll figure it out in a different way. Vilgax said and looked at the monitors. The monitors showed Lex in the image as different aliens. Despite the fact that Lex tried not to get caught, many people managed to photograph him during the heroic deeds. I know what to do. I'll set a trap for him. We go down to the planet. Vilgax gave the order. And the ship began to enter the Earth's atmosphere. After 15 minutes, 
the ship was already at an altitude of one kilometer from the ground. 200 drones and one large sphere with spikes flew out of the ship. The robots went towards the city to wreak house there and lure our hero out. Underscore. Lex POV. A few hours later, it was time to have breakfast, but we still drove non-stop. Apparently, Grandfather is very much afraid of Vilgax. At the moment, we were going about our business, Gwen was sitting in her laptop, I was reading a book, and Ashley was just messing around. As we drove, Ashley saw smoke from a nearby town through the window. Look, someone needs help there. Ashley said and pointed to the city. You stay here. I can handle it myself. This is most likely a trap. I said and started getting off the bus. Lex, I don't think you should do this. Grandpa said with concern. Don't worry, Grandpa. I can handle. If anything, then immediately teleport to the RV. Until then, go to Mount Rushmore. And be careful. Girls protect Grandpa. I said. Good. Don't worry about us. We'll be fine. Gwen said with a smile. Yes. Everything will be just fine. You better be careful. Ashley said with the same smile. Hearing their words, I also smiled and turned into two tails, teleported out. After that, I turned into Jet Ray and flew at full speed to the city, in which I was already half a minute later. There were about 200 drones here. And they were clearly different from those to which I was used. These were more powerful and abruptly. The drones are now attacking everything they can see. Without wasting time, I immediately turned into four arms and pulled out my sword, activated the lightsaber mode. This will be a great test drive for my sword, and I will be able to warm up a lot. With the help of the sword, I began to destroy the drones, of course they shot at me, but I always dodged. Thanks to the drones, I got even better at adapting to the sword and getting better and better at handling it. After two minutes, the drones ran out. I didn't even sweat. Quickly somehow. At that moment, my newfound spider sense sent a signal to me. After listening to him, I jumped up and dodged the laser grid. After doing a somersault, I landed on the ground and looked over to where the net came from. So there was a huge ball with spikes. After a couple of seconds, the ball split and a cockpit appeared inside it. Opening the door, Vilgax himself climbed out. And most importantly, G.O.T. out so pathetically. The shadow almost completely covered him, and there was also a lot of smoke. Poser. Vilgax. Something you take long. I said casually, putting my sword on my shoulder. Of course I have already deactivated the laser's saber mode. You know me? The alien asked with notes of surprise. Yes. Grandpa told me about you. You must remember him. His name is Max Tennyson. I said with a shrug. Tennyson? So you are his grandson. This explains a lot. Then you know why I'm here. Restraining anger, Vilgax said. Yes. Yes. You want the Omnitrix. Having received it, you will conquer the entire galaxy and blah blah blah. I said casually. So give it to me. Said Vilgax, already clearly enraged. F asterisk CKU. If you want it, take it yourself. I said, and invitingly moved both hands at once. As you wish. Said Vilgax and ran at me. The blow was quite simple and I easily dodged it and at the same time pushed Vilgax in the back. I also put the footboard. From this he fell and flew a couple of meters. Vilgax stood up and shouted. How dare you? And again he ran at me. And I did the same. Repeatedly. Finally enraged, Vilgax shot lasers at me from his eyes, from which I dodged. And I decided to end it. I ran up to Vilgax and hit him in the face. Then I turned into two tails and taking Vilgax with my tails teleported high into the sky to a height of four kilometers. 
Once again becoming four arms, I took Vilgax stronger and said. If you want revenge, I'll be waiting for you at Mount Rushmore. After which, with all the power, I threw him into the ground. He will land somewhere in the field. By the way, I managed to scan his DNA. Oh, how I wanted to end him now, once and for all. But then history is too much to change. And there will be more problems than a living Vilgax will deliver. Yeeg, and I still need it. It will be very useful to me a couple of times. And I cannot miss such a jackpot, just because of my desires. Before I started to fall, I turned into two tails again and teleported to the mobile home. There was no one inside, and the bus itself was already under Mount Rushmore. Becoming myself, I left the mobile home and walked towards the armory, where I found the girls and grandfather. Well, how? Seeing me, Grandpa asked immediately. Things are good. As I thought it was a trap. Vilgax himself arrived. But I was able to get rid of him, for a while. True, I made him very angry. So, he's probably already on his way here, with his entire army of robots. I said. Well, I'm fully prepared to face the old enemy. Said the grandfather and took out a huge cannon. How does he hold her in general, she weighs hell knows how much. Good. Are you girls ready? I asked. Completely slash yes. Said the girls at the same time, while putting on their costumes. Well then, let's go. I said, put on a suit and went to the side of the elevator to go up to the very top. There it would be best to accept the battle. When we got up, we could already see the Vilgax ship from which robots began to appear. There were about 500 drones and about 200 large robots. At the top of the ship was Vilgax himself. Apparently, it was a challenge. Okay. On you robots, and on me Vilgax. I said, and turning into Jet Ray, I flew to Vilgax. The grandpa and the girls began to destroy the army of robots. When I flew up to Vilgax, I attacked him with a laser from my eyes. Vilgax responded in kind. In this competition on laser beams, Vilgax won. But I just fired a laser from the tail and knocked it down. Then he turned into forearms and jumped on Vilgax, thereby piercing the ship's firmware with his body. Once inside, we continued our duel. This time Vilgax showed his skill in hand-to-hand -hand combat and it was much more difficult for me. I even received some very painful blows. Apparently last time he just underestimated me. Since I was losing, I decided to fill my body with mana. A haze of blue came out of my body, and my physical characteristics increased by almost 30%. After that, I began to win. With the last blow, I broke through the wall with Vilgax's body and we got to the core of the ship. Deciding it was time to end this, I took out my sword and cut off Vilgax's arm. He growled in pain and was distracted. Hey, Vilgax, I want you to know. Your arm was cut off by a 15-year-old boy. I said and showed my human form. What? Vilgax asked, dumbfounded. And while Vilgax was freaking out, I turned into an upgrade and took the form of a robot, after which I fired a volley from all the guns at Vilgax. The shots blew him into the core, after which I fired into the core itself several more times. New, Vilgax shouted when he realized what I wanted to do. See you. I said, saluting and turning into two tails teleported to the family. After I left, a huge explosion occurred in the core, which destroyed the entire ship. Underscore. Third POV. Vilgax, seeing the hopelessness of the situation, decided to flee. With his remaining hand, he took out the emergency teleportation device and activated it. But because of the explosion that occurred, the device malfunctioned and transferred Vilgax not to his planet, but directly into outer space. Vilgax holding the stump from his hand, understanding the situation, shouted. Tennyson. After a couple of minutes, Vilgax coped with the anger and said. I'll come back and take revenge on you, boy. The Omnitrix will be mine. 
and I will conquer this universe. Then, he took out a communication device and called for help. Underscore. Lex POV. After teleportation, I became human and looked around. My family was fine, but they were all sitting on the ground and breathing heavily, and next to him could see a bunch of broken robots. How are you? I asked, sitting down. Things are good. We did it. And when the ship exploded, all the entire robots were out of order. Gwen said, breathing heavily. And how are you? Asked Grandpa. Fine. I got a couple of bruises, of course, but they will go away quickly. Vilgax exploded along with the ship, but I'm just sure he'll be back. I told. You're right about that. It is not the first time for him to return from the dead. Grandpa said with a tired smile. Went. Let's go back to base and rest. I said, getting up. Everyone nodded at my words and we went down underground and immediately went to bed. Without even eating. Today was a tough day. The first month of vacation is over.